And we are live. What's up, guys? Welcome to Fed It. Today, we're going to be going over the Osama bin Laden manhunt that the CIA conducted for almost 20 years. This is going to be a good one, guys. Let's get into it. I was a special agent with Homeland Security Investigations, okay, guys? HSI. The cases that I did mostly were human smuggling and drug trafficking. No one else has these documents, by the way. Here's what Fed It covers. Dr. Lafredo confirmed lacerations due to stepping on glass. Murder investigation. You see him reaching in his jacket. You don't know. And he's positioning. Been on February 13, 2019. You're facing two counts of two murder. Racketeering and Rico conspiracy. Young, young slime life here and after referred to as YSL. The defendants is, uh, six nine. And then this is Billy Seiko right here. Now, when they first started, guys, six nine ran. Well, I'm a fed. I'm watching this music video. You know, I'm bobbing my head like, hey, this shit lit. But at the same time, I'm pausing. Oh, wait, who this? Right? Oh, who's that in the back? Firearms and violent crimes. AKA, who should I see violated? In order to stay away from the victim. Rapper, who should I see arrested after shooting at King of Diamonds, Miami Strip Club, injured one this person. Is the, this is the one that, that's going to fuck him up because this gun is not traceable. Well, it happened at the gun range. Here's your boy, 42 Doug, right here on the left. Okay. Sex trafficking and sex crimes. Yeah. They can effectively link him to paying an underage girl. I'm going to love my trip Right. And well, the first bomb went off right here. Suspect two sent down a backpack at the site of the second explosion. Inspired by Al Qaeda. Two terrorists, their brothers, the Zokar Sarnev and Tamer Lin Sarnev. When the cartel shipped drugs into the country. As this guy got arrested for um, espionage, okay, trading secrets with the Russians for monetary compensation. The largest corrupt police bust in New Orleans history. The days of the police are gone. gone. So he was in this bad boy. We're going to go over his past, the gang ties, so that this all makes sense. All right, and we're back. What's up, guys? Welcome to Fed It. Today, we're going to be breaking down the Osama Bin Laden case and how they found him, namely the CIA and the intelligence agencies. So real quick, so that this all makes sense, guys, this is part two of a multi-part series, okay? And what's going to happen here, guys, is I'm going to have to, the whole 9-11 situation i'm going to have to break down systematically so for you guys to get the full scope of this i need you guys to, well check this out i just dropped the you know john gacy killer clown serial killer episode earlier today and uh right now it's 5 37 in the morning eastern standard time guys so we're doing the double header but you're gonna have to see this episode right here on 9 11 okay plans to basically in this episode guys i got all the time standing there for all. and basically i go over how the fbi well the 9-11 attacks, how they occurred, and then how the FBI was able to systematically do their investigation and identify Al-Qaeda as the perpetrators. Now, with that said, guys, um, they were able to link the attacks back to ultimately to Osama bin Laden and, and Al-Qaeda. But if you guys to understand the full story of how they were able to actually conduct these attacks, we're going to have to go into the man himself, bin Laden, and get his background information. So I have a documentary here called Manhunt, okay? Uh, and I also have uh, Osama Bin Laden, The Rise and Fall. Uh, so we're going to watch this first um, so that you guys get a better idea because a lot of people don't really know the background of Osama Bin Laden. You know, he's an educated guy, came from a very wealthy family, multimillionaire. A lot of people don't know this. So for you guys to truly understand how he turned from a freedom fighter into the world's largest terrorist at one time, the most wanted man in the world, we're going to have to go back in time, okay? know the man's origin so uh let's start with the documentary on him okay and of course they put this little thing is oh inappropriate offensive to some audiences anything that has to do with 9-11 or bin laden guys they almost always either age restriction or or um uh you know limit the monetization it kind of sucks but uh anyway let's uh get right into it So first, we're going to start with his family. Now, we're not going to play this entire um, documentary, guys, but we are going to play a good portion of it so you guys understand how Bin Laden rose to, be, rose to become the most wanted terrorist in the world. The Bin Laden lineage originated in Hadramaut in Yemen, a harsh, arid place where even today's citizens live impoverished, restricted lives. So he's originally from Yemen. Bin Laden's his family ancestral village is Al Rabat in the Wadi Doan Valley, where Bin Laden Street can still be found along with a crumbling Bin Laden mansion. 
To this day, distant cousins of the Bin Ladens still live in the area, eking out the most basic living. In the 1930s, Osama Bin Laden's father, Mohammed, and his brother, Abdullah, left Al Rabat to seek a better life in Saudi Arabia. Their timing was perfect, as the oil reserves in the Saudi desert were starting to be discovered in commercial quantities by the Americans. Oh, that oil money coming. After initially finding work as a porter in Jeddah, Mohammed, a skilled bricklayer, formed a prosperous construction company and worked on projects for Abdul Aziz ibn Saud, the first king of Saudi Arabia. Mohammed's shrewd business sense and hard work contributed to his business's phenomenal success, and his family became known as the wealthiest non-royal family in the kingdom. His- now that's huge, guys. They're basically right there with the Saudi princes and kings and, uh, you know, the Saudi royalty. And just so y'all know, his father became a billionaire, guys, okay? So a um, billion dollars back then? I mean, hell, we can do the math. I'll uh, pull out my inflation calculator here in a second. Close links to the Saudi royal family ensured he was never short of huge projects to work on. In total, Mohammed had 11 wives and fathered 52 children. Holy goddamn! Oh, shit! Oh, he was shit. smashing all kinds of chicks. I've always said it, man. Men with status and money have always had all the women, man. Hypergamy is real. However, the only one known to the wider world is his 18th child, Osama bin Mohammed bin Awad bin Laden. Osama was born on the 15th... Yes, guys, that is his actual full name. Uh, 18th child, Osama bin Mohammed bin Awad... <laughs> you know what's kind of funny? Uh, yeah, this is my middle name right here, Awad. So, uh, hilarious stuff. But yeah, um, Osama bin Mohammed bin Awad bin Laden. Yeah, guys, I had a super long last name like that too, Arab last name, and I had to actually get it legally shortened, which is kind of funny. But um, yeah, but yeah, there's a young Osama right there, guys, with the with the stash. Bin Laden. Hassan was born on the 15th of February, 1957, to Mohammed's 11th and last wife, Alia Ghanem. Alia was just 14 years old when she met 50-year-old Mohammed during his visit. To the- God damn, that's a huge age gap right there. But hey, man, uh, this is very common in the Middle East, guys. Port city of Latakia in Syria. Like the Bin Laden family, Alia's family hailed from Yemen, but instead of setting in Saudi, Alia's family became Syrian citizens and made their living as citrus farmers. Unlike Muhammad, Alia was brought up as an Alawite, not a Sunni Muslim. Alawi Muslims are a minority group who practice an esoteric form of Shia Islam. However, that didn't seem to bother Muhammad, and he married Alia, and she moved with him to Saudi Arabia. Less than a year after their marriage, Osama was born. The marriage lasted until Osama was two years old when the couple divorced. Aliyah later married Mohammed al Atas, who worked as a manager at the Bin Laden Construction Company. Atas brought up Osama as his own, and he and Aliyah went on to have three sons and a daughter together. All right, so now we know who his mother is, who his father is, his father's um, you know, wealth that he built from doing construction projects. Uh, alongside the royal family and during the booming oil industry in the 30s. Osama was extremely close to his mother, but had little interaction with his father. He was raised along with his half-siblings as a devout Sunni Muslim. However, even though he was a Bin Laden and a member of one of the richest families in Saudi, he was somewhat of an outsider despite having over 50 brothers and sisters and he and his mother were not treated as members of the Bin Laden extended clan, likely because his mother was from the Alawite sect and wasn't considered part of the Muslim community in Saudi. At the age of 10, Osama suffered personal heartache when on September 3rd, 1967, his father Mohammed died in a plane crash. His small private... All right, so this is a little bit of a turning point here in Osama's life, guys. You're going to see uh, some things are about to change here after his father passes. ...aircraft crashed when trying to land on a remote strip of land near the Yemen border. Both Mohammed and his American pilot were killed. He was 60 years old and by some accounts was traveling to marry his 12th wife. Even though Osama wasn't close to his father, reportedly only meeting him on a handful of occasions, the trauma of losing him led Osama to seek solace in the Quran, and he memorized its text, and eventually could recite all 6,000 verses. The already subdued little boy also became even more introverted. So. 
you guys can see here that the radicalization is almost, you know, it's in the infant stages here. Um, and, you know, Osama was extremely religious. I mean, the guy uh, prayed, I think, uh, five to seven times a day. He fasted on um, on certain days of the week, every week versus only on Ramadan, just like the prophet did. So he was a very devout Muslim. And you're going to see this devoutness, if that's a word, devoutness, um, morph into extremism here. You know, it started with good intentions and it quickly morphs into something far more evil. At the time of his death, Muhammad's company was reputed to be worth five billion US dollars and Osama later inherited around $25 million. Guys, so 20, he was worth $1 billion. Let's do the math on that real fast, okay? So, uh, so he died in 67, right? So let's go ahead and do the math, right? Okay, so let's Google this. One billion dollars in 1967 today. Mm. Okay, hold on. It won't let me even put the billion in. That's how much it is. All right. Let me go back to the documentary. I'll have the number here for you guys in a second. While I search this. Even more introverted. At the time of his death, Muhammad's company was reputed to be worth five billion U.S. dollars, and Osama later inherited around twenty-five million dollars. So he got twenty-five million. The company was worth five billion. Well, let's let's do the math with twenty-five million. Twenty-five. Here, I'll keep going. I'll get the numbers for you guys here in a second. A year after his father's death, Osama, aged 11, attended the elite Al Thaga model school in Jeddah, considered to be one of the most progressive schools in Saudi Arabia. At the school, Osama was remembered as not the brightest, but by far the tallest and most courteous of his peers. Osama was six, six foot four, by the way, guys, extremely tall. In 1971, when Osama was 14 years old, he spent the summer in the United Kingdom studying English language at a school in Oxford. He was accompanied on the trip by two of his older half-brothers. And whilst they relished their time in the West, Osama did not. He later... Okay, guys, just so you know, 25 million in 1967 is worth $222,161,676.67 today. Crazy, man. Now I'm going to search 5 billion for y'all told his own children he refused to go back to the United Kingdom the following year because a pious Muslim should not go to the lands of the West. Osama believed the British were morally degenerate. But whilst Osama was rejecting the West, many of his half-siblings embraced it and his eldest brother, Salam, attended the prestigious English boarding school Millfield. Most of the Bin Laden siblings were pro-American and westernized and their vast wealth afforded them the luxury to travel all over the world and eventually over half of Osama's siblings were either educated or later lived in Britain or the US. Salem. And just so y'all know, $5 billion back then was worth $44 billion to $432,335,329.34 today. Holy shit. He would basically be right up there with Bill Gates in today's dollars, guys. $5 billion in 67, $44.4 billion, guys. Oh, shit. So oh, now shit. you guys know the gravity of the individual we're talking about on this on this pod, man. Osama bin Laden, guys, was not a bum. <laughs> you know, $25 million, you know, he pretty much got after his father passed in 67. Now you guys know why he was the head of Al-Qaeda and why he was able to fund terrorist activities for the better part of two decades. Let's keep going. Osama's eldest brother particularly enjoyed all that came with his power and money. He was the one who was now heading the business empire and often treated his many siblings to trips around the world. This iconic photograph of 23 of the Bin Laden brothers and sisters. There you can see Bin Laden right there uh, in the corner with his sister. And look at this big family, man. His, his dad was out here smashing. Goddamn. Sisters, leaning up against a pink Cadillac was during a visit to Sweden in 1971. 
Allegedly, Osama can be seen happily posing next to his sister. However, whilst his fabulously wealthy brothers and sisters enjoyed their luxury westernized lifestyle, Osama was following a totally different course. He started attending an after-school Islamic study session, led by a Syrian teacher who had a huge influence on young Osama. It is not known who the teacher was, but it's thought that he may have been a member of the Muslim Brotherhood, a transitional Sunni Islamic organization that seeks to inject Islam into the political arena. Okay, so you guys can see. So now it's building upon itself, right? So step one, become extremely devout, extremely religious. Step two, join an Islamic cult to a degree that wants to inject Islam into other parts of uh, society and politics. Hmm. Already raising some red flags. Osama started adopting the style and habits of Islamists, wearing shortened leg trousers and growing a beard. Islamists believe that Islam should guide social, political and personal life. However, it's worth pointing out that Islamism is not a form of the Muslim faith or an expression of Muslim piety. Instead, it is a political ideology. Yes. It's been described as an anti-ideology, opposing almost everything. It is an anti-Semitic, anti-Israeli, anti-Christian, anti-Western and anti-American due to its distorted view of Jews' role in the United States. And let me put an emphasis here on anti-Semitic, guys. Um, I'm just going to, I don't know a better way to say this, so I'm just going to say it. Um, the, the Middle East is extremely anti-Semitic, guys. Um, conflicts in Israel, between Israel and Palestine, and, you know, basically a lot of Muslim countries feel as though the, the Jewish people uh, robbed them of their lands, and that has led to a lot of conflict and bloodshed in the Middle East. And um, that constant fighting has and and you know in the US's support of Israel which then you know obviously fights against the Palestinians Muslims that has basically galvanized the Middle East to have extremely anti uh anti-semitic uh views against the Jews and the United States as a whole and all western countries that support Israel which is a foundational pillar as to the hatred of the west from the Middle East guys so um you know just so you guys kind of understand where this is coming from. Let's continue on. Islamism is not about the Islamic faith. It's an extremely dangerous ideology that distorts religion and reality to fit its anti-platform. It was around this time that Osama told family members he had started thinking about jihad. To explain jihad can mean three things to Islam. Which is basically a holy war, guys. One, a personal struggle in devotion to Islam, especially involving spiritual discipline. Two, a crusade for a principle or belief. Or three, as was the case with Osama, a holy war waged on behalf of Islam as a religious duty. Osama became fanatical and started praying more than the five times a day required by his faith, and fasted every Monday and Thursday, just as the Prophet Muhammad had done. Yeah, only very religious and devout. Uh, Muslims do that and follow in the Prophet's footsteps. Although he had few friends growing up, when he invited them over, he would encourage them to chant hymns about Palestine. However, it wasn't all religion. He was also known. See, it comes back to, you know, that Palestine and Israeli conflict. You know, that's that is the root cause of a lot of the issues that we have, um, you know, in general with the Middle East, you know, between the West and the Middle East. And, you know, I wish they would make some goddamn peace, man. But it probably won't happen. This is a battle that's been going on for decades, guys. ...to enjoy cowboy films, Bruce Lee movies, and anything to do with horses. He loved horses, and when he was older, he kept many of them at various places he lived. He also loved fast cars, the faster the better, and his pride and joy as a teenager with his white Chrysler with red leather interior. All right, so now he's about to become an adult and have children of his own. When Osama turned 17, thoughts turned to marriage. And after he visited Syria with his mother, he asked if he could marry his younger cousin, Najwa, who was the daughter of his mother's brother. Okay, so this is something that's fairly common in, in uh, Middle Eastern culture, guys. Let me just put this out there. A lot of the times they'll marry a cousin or a distant cousin in the family. And I know like, what the hell? Yeah. I agree. But this it happens, you know, in in, uh, in Middle Eastern culture. So this was not necessarily um, abnormal. All right. 
uh, it's actually it's very common. Uh, though we, we think it's the gross, and I agree, I think it's gross too, but yep, this is what they did a lot of the times. And for obvious reasons, this can lead to um, birth defects. The families agreed to match, and 17-year-old Osama and 15-year-old Najwa were married in 1974. The wedding was held at the home of Najwa's parents in Syria. It was a very simple ceremony that followed Osama's fundamentalist beliefs. There was no music, singing or jokes, and laughter was banned. But the marriage, according to Najwa, was a love match. From the moment Najwa married the cousin she adored, her life was lived in isolation according to her husband's wishes. If she went out in public, she had to be completely covered head to toe in black robes and accompanied by a male relative or friend, only permitted to see the outside world through a black veil. Osama and his new wife moved to Saudi Arabia and lived with his mother at her house in Jeddah. Within a year, Najwa was pregnant and gave birth to a son, Abdullah. At the time, Osama was still in high school. Osama went on to have at least five more wives and fathered around 25 children. God damn, bro, these dudes out oh, here shit. Oh, shit. smashing all day. After graduating from high school in 1976, Osama went to King Abdul University in Jeddah, where he befriended a boy called Jamal. They both shared the same religious ideology. The two friends often went riding together and would spend nights in the desert sleeping on the sand and eating only dates and water. These desert stays were Bin Laden's ways of testing himself in extreme conditions to toughen himself up for a time of deprivation that he believed was to come. It was during Bin Laden's time at university that he developed very literal interpretations of Islam, and he felt if he did not follow them, God would punish him. He also met Ab All right, so as you guys can see, the indoctrination and the uh, extremism is, is slowly following. You know, it's it's not moderation; it's extremism now at this point. You know, it's oh, I gotta adhere to the Quran one hundred percent. This is the literal meaning of what they're saying. You know, I you know I hate the West. I don't like it. It's scum. Blah blah blah. So you guys can start to see here slowly but surely he's starting to morph. Abdullah Azam for the first time, who was a lecturer at King Abdul. Azam was a Palestinian Sunni Islamic scholar and theologian and an influential Salafist jihadist to help the Afghan who went on to preach defensive jihadi by Muslims to help the Afghan Mujahideen against the Soviet invaders. Okay, this is very, very important here, guys. Okay, so in 1979, right around uh, 79, the Soviet Union invaded Afghanistan. And this right here essentially created the Mujahideen, who is, is going to form into later on Al-Qaeda. We'll talk about that. But this is where um, bin Laden steps up. Some had previously fought the Israelis when they invaded Palestine in 1967 and he had experience of guerrilla warfare. Hazam was a major influencer and mentor to the young Osama bin Laden and his influence almost certainly contributed to bin Laden's extreme. And this guy obviously is anti-Jew, right? Because he's Palestinian, he fought against the Jews in 67. So now the Soviets are invading Afghanistan. So what does he do? He gears up the troops and he's like, hey, you guys are invading Islamic land. We need to band together and fight. Beliefs. In 1978, Najwa had a second child, another boy they called Abdul Raham. The following year, whilst pregnant again, Najwa and her two young children joined Osama on a surprise visit to the United States, which he told her was a business trip. In reality, Osama was meeting with Abdullah Azam, who was in the US on a speaking tour to recruit jihad. Osama and you guys are probably wondering, what the hell? So wait, you're telling me Osama's been in the United States? Yes. <laughs> Back in 78. Uh, and he came to meet this guy, who also was uh, an extremist. I met up with Azam to discuss a role for him in the movement. Whilst in America, baby Abdul Raham, who was born with hydrocephalus, became ill, and the couple sought help from a doctor in Indianapolis. After their return, Najwa gave birth to a third son they called Said. At this point... And keep in mind also, guys, that Osama was a Saudi citizen. As a Saudi citizen, Though they're not visa visa waiver, um, they enjoy certain benefits that other Middle Eastern countries do not, which includes you know the ability to get a visa a little bit a visa a little bit easier since Saudi Arabia is a first world country and is not 
necessarily uh you know, on like a terrorist watch list. And man, of course, and this is back in the 70s, you know, the FBI was more concerned with the La Cosa Nostra than terrorism, if you know what I'm saying. And Osama decided to skip graduating from university and work full time for the family construction business. Osama tried to emulate the father he idolized by being hands on with the workers and was often seen driving bulldozers and eating with the staff. Just and Osama was a civil engineer, by the way, guys, as well. Very humble, as you guys can see, eating with the staff, driving the bulldozers. He's doing the groundwork with his guys. As his father had, his eldest brother, Salim, had now taken over from his father and was now at the helm of the company and was as successful as his father at generating big contracts. Salim built the business even more by diversifying into other areas, including engineering and telecommunication systems. Salim acted as the patriarch of the Bin Laden family after their father's death. And as well as being in charge of the family's vast income, he also oversaw the individual education plans for each of his half-brothers and sisters. He also continued the close relationship with the Saudi royal family. Ironically, Salim bin Laden was one of the investors in the Arbusto oil company created by George W. Bush in 1979. Oh shit. Interesting links. He also owned a house in Orlando, Florida. Sadly, just like his father, his love of piloting his private planes caused his death when in 1988 he hit a high voltage electrical power line on the edge of Shirts in Texas. Wow. Talk about crazy fate of events. 1979 was not only the year Bin Laden's third son was born, but it was also a turning point for Muslims all over the world. When on November 20th, worshippers were attacked at Masjid Al-Haram, the holiest mosque in Islam in Mecca, Saudi Arabia. The insurgents declared that the Mahdi, the redeemer of Islam, had arrived in the form of one of their leaders, Muhammad Abdullah al qatani and called on Muslims to obey him. The Saudi army, advised by French commandos, fought for almost two weeks to reclaim the Grand Mosque. The attack shocked the Islamic world. Wow. Muhammad was killed in the recapture of the mosque, and the rebels who survived the assault were captured and later beheaded. Official reports stated that 255 fanatics yeah, Saudi Arabia doesn't play with that shit, guys. They're going to give you the... If you mess with them, bro. Troops and pilgrims were killed. Behead! And 560 were injured. Following the attack, the Saudi king implemented a stricter enforcement of Sharia law. Shortly after, on December 26th, an infidel Soviet army invaded Afghanistan. Bin Laden... Infidel stands for non-believer, guys. ...and was deeply upset by this event and made it his mission to help the Afghan resistance. He responded to the invasion by what he called godless communists by gathering up as much money as he could from relatives and the family business to donate to the Afghan resistance fighters known as Mujahideen. And in 1980, he traveled to Pakistan where he met up again with Abdullah Azam. Together, they set up Maktab al Kidimat, also known as the Afghan Service Bureau, to raise funds and recruit foreign Mujahideen for the war against the Soviets in Afghanistan. And there's a special donor for the Mujahideen, by the way, guys. You're going to see here in a second who it was. From this point, Osama became heavily involved in the Afghan struggle, collecting millions of dollars from wealthy Gulf donors and making frequent visits to Pakistan. The fight became his sole focus. Azam had convinced him to help personally finance the training of recruits. Bin Laden's fortune paid for air tickets and accommodation, dealt with paperwork needed for Pakistani authorities and provided other services for the jihad fighters. Azam, who shared Osama's outrage at the Soviet invasion, issued a fatwa, declaring defense of the Muslim lands, stating that both the Afghan and Palestinian struggles were jihads, and that all able-bodied Muslims had a duty to fight against foreign occupations of Islamic countries. However, this ruling went beyond traditional interpretations of defense. And just so you guys know, a fatwa is a legal ruling on a point of Islamic law, Sharia, given by a qualified jurist in response to a question posed by a private individual. Defense of Jihad. Azam moved to Peshawar, closer to the Afghan border, where he set up paramilitary training camps in Afghanistan to prepare international recruits for the Afghan war front. And these paramilitary training camps are going to become terrorist training camps in the future. An estimated 16,000 to 35,000 Muslim volunteers from around the world came to fight in Afghanistan. Employing tactics of asymmetric warfare, 
the Afghan resistance movement was able to fend off the military's superior Soviet armed forces through most of the war, although the lightly armed Afghan Mujahideen suffered enormous casualties. Throughout the 1980s, the Saudi Arabian government and the US Central Intelligence Agency gradually increased financial and military assistance to the Afghan Mujahideen forces in an effort to stem Soviet pro- You guys heard that? So there you have it. The US and the CIA was funding the Mujahideen to fight the Soviets in the late 70s, guys. So that- Oh shit, oh shit, oh shit. And little did they know that these dollars would be used for more nefarious purposes that would hurt us later on. But back then, guys, remember, we Russia was, you know, the enemy world power. So the United States was hell bent on doing anything to weaken the Soviet Union back then. Progress and to destabilize the Soviet Union. Abdullah Azam frequently joined Afghan militias as he became an inspirational figure among the Afghan resistance and freedom fighting Muslims worldwide. He inspired young Muslims with stories of miraculous deeds. He published a book called Signs of the Most Merciful in the Afghan Holy War. And in it, he recounted stories of miracles as a result of God's grace, saying fighters who were struck by bullets were unharmed and birds circle in flocks to distract enemy helicopters. He also claimed Afghan Jihad were martyrs who always died with smiles on their faces and their dead bodies gave off a sweet musk-like odor. Osama was in awe of his older mentor and seemed to have... And of course, this is propaganda to incite people to go ahead and join the, the you know, what they would deem as a holy war, you know, to get volunteers in. ...and the father figure he longed for. Azam was driving Osama's extreme beliefs. It wasn't until 1989 that the FBI office in Dallas started investigating Azam for his role in recruiting fighters for the Soviet-Afghan war. So the FBI puts, you know... Uh, a target on his mentor Azam's back in 89. Damn near 10 years after the Soviet resistance, right? You know, closer to the Soviet collapse, actually. During the first four years of the war in Afghanistan, bin Laden went back and forth from Saudi to Pakistan, bringing donations and supporting the cause. But he'd never actually crossed the border into Afghanistan. His family had advised against it. However, in 1984, Azam persuaded Osama to cross to see for himself what was going on. At first, he was terrified, and the sounds of explosions scared the life out of him. But once he reached the camps, he was horrified by the state of the weapons the Afghans were using and the conditions they were fighting in. He felt a sense of guilt and embarrassment that he had not visited the site before, and believed because he's just a rich financier, you know? He doesn't know what's going on. He doesn't know the ill effects of war. So obviously he goes in there, he sees his Muslim, Muslim brother struggling. He's like, what the fuck? You know, and remember, he's used to a life of affluence, having money, etc. Though he was a humble individual, um, it's still, you know, it, it was a wake-up call for him. The only way God would pardon him for his sins was to be martyred. When Osama went back to Saudi, he was even more determined to help fight the holy war and raised vast amounts of money for the cause through friends and relatives. He also started paying $300,000 a year to help Muslims around the world who wanted to travel to Pakistan and sign up to fight the cause. Azam and Osama also started publishing a magazine they called Jihad Magazine. The monthly Arabic publication became a vital tool for recruiting Muslim volunteers from around the world for Afghan Jihad. Azam was very much the driving force behind recruitment at this stage, and Bin Laden was barely mentioned in the publications. The magazine was distributed in over 50 countries and used the most up-to-date media reports to spread propaganda. And at its height, 70,000 copies were being printed. And just so you guys know, $300,000 back then was around $1 million today, guys. So he was donating a million dollars a year to the cause. Into the month. All the while, Bin Laden continued to flip between the Afghan war and the family business. He also started thinking about marrying again. In Islam, polygamy is usual, but Bin Laden held the view that marrying multiple women like his father did, purely for gratification, was wrong. And to be a true Muslim, you should marry only four wives, and then only if you could treat them all equally. In Which is the standard in the, in the Quran, guys. If you're going to have multiple wives, you need to be able to support them all 
equally the same from a financial standpoint. That means if you buy one a house, the other one's got to have a house. If you buy one, another one a house, they basically got to be treated equally from a financial standpoint and get all the same resources. It's kind of a checks and balances to ensure that only the highest status of men are able to have multiple wives. Hey, hypergamy once again, even in religion, guys. 1983, with thoughts of marrying again, Bin Laden bought a large house close to his mother's in Saudi. But he chose to leave the house undecorated with no personal effects and an overall color scheme of gray. He also refused to turn on the air conditioning or the refrigerator, despite the brutal hot climate of Saudi. He liked the, you know, the challenge. And as you guys know, right when he was younger, what was he doing? He was going around in the desert, eating dates with his friend, not having much water, putting himself through that fasting twice a week, twice a week. He always tested his, his limits, right? And even though he grew up rich, he tried everything in his power to not come off as a rich, pompous kid. He liked to work with individuals when he was in the construction company. He wanted to be on the front lines when they were fighting war in Afghanistan. That's just how this dude was. He believed Islamic beliefs were being corrupted by modernization. His wife, Najwa, was not thrilled about the prospect of her husband taking another wife. And the couple spent many hours discussing the issue. But ultimately, Bin Laden talked her around. Najwa was already on her fifth pregnancy, and Osama had told her that to bring many more Muslims into the world, he needed to take more wives, and that if she was content in her heart for him to take a second wife, she would gain in heaven. And it was certain that her life would end in paradise. For the love of her husband, Najwa agreed. In 1983, Bin Laden married his second wife, Khadija Sharif. In 1985, he married a third wife, a lady his first wife had chosen for him, called Karia Saber. <laughs> oh shit, your wife is finding you wives? That's what's up, man. And also, guys, um, keep in mind that, you know, this is, you know, a lot of the times when people are having multiple wives, etc., they look at it like, yo, we need to have more children. Well, guess what? A woman can only bring you one child uh, per year. So what do you do to, you know, multiply that? Get another wife. In 1987, Bin Laden took a fourth wife, the sister of his close friend, Saad al-Sharif, named Saiham Sabah. Bin Laden had no trouble finding wives, as in Saudi he was becoming increasingly celebrated for his support of jihadi fighters in Afghanistan. So, back then, guys, you guys can see, he's looked at as a hero because he's you know, gathering funds, he's helping the Afghanis in their cause. You know, it's, it's very respected, guys, to, um, it's very respected to, to fight for Islamic land. And the fact that he was there on the front lines as a multimillionaire, you know, in there, in the trenches with the people, uh, you know, as an affluent individual, supporting the cause, fighting on the front lines, they respected him. So when he goes back to Saudi Arabia, he's almost like a folk hero, you know, because a lot of people are, don't have the balls to step into a combat zone and fight off the Soviets who they looked at as the enemy because they were invading Islamic lands. So to, to, um, to his peers, to his friends, to his family, they were like, oh, this dude is the fucking shit. Now you're going to see where things start to turn, take a side, uh, for, take a dark turn. And was considered a genuine war hero. That, in addition to his wealth, made him a perfect suitor. So you already know the girls are loving this dude, right? By 1986, Osama was frequently crossing the Pakistan border into Afghanistan to fight as a guerrilla commander, leading his Arab troops into battle with the Russians. It was around this time that his once close relationship with Abdullah Azam started to sour. Their views on fighting the Holy War differed. Osama wanted to create a standalone Arab force to fight the Soviets, soldiers that were prepared to martyr themselves for the cause, whereas Azam wanted to build the Afghan Mujahideen and scatter Arab forces amongst them to boost morale, educate, and get updates for the wealthy Middle Eastern donors. It made more sense to him to have one army rather than two. But Bin Laden was hellbent on his own idea and selected an area around Jaji in eastern Afghanistan to build a new base for his warriors that he named Oh, here we go. The Lion's Den. The area was not ideal because in winter it would become blocked by snow during the brutal Afghan winters, making supplies impossible to get through. Despite knowing this, Bin Laden pushed on with his plan and work began on the base in October of 1986. Bin Laden and four of his followers lived in a tent as they began construction. The conditions were brutal. Soon there were 16 Saudis working on the project, building underground shelters and bunkers. They also brought in their first machine guns. 
As the numbers grew, more arms were brought in from Pakistan, including AK-47s and rocket-propelled grenades, and the group of about 40 started mounting small attacks against the Soviets, and soon there were casualties. Allegedly, on more than one occasion, he took his young sons to the lion's den to educate them on his passion for jihad, much to the dismay of his family and his unenthusiastic young offspring. His old friends back in- Now you can see where the radicalization is also starting to set in. Now he's bringing his children, radicalizing them, uh, you know, to fighting this war, which, you know, isn't what you should be doing with your children. But Bin Laden was obsessed, guys. He's, he was obsessed, which, you know, led to his downfall. Saudi noticed a change in Osama. He was no longer introverted and shy. He became more assertive and started making speeches at mosques and other gathering places. His speeches mainly focused not on Afghanistan, but his obsession with Palestine and the Israelis. And he urged his audience to boycott all you. See, I told you guys, everything stems from the Israeli and US alliance. US goods, because he believed without the support of the US, Israel could not exist. See, exactly. That's why, every, that right there, guys, is why so many of these terrorists, these crazy uh, extremists hate the United States and the West is because of Israel, because of our support for Israel. You know, and it's sad that we can't come to a happy middle ground because the thing is, guys, uh, me personally speaking as, as a Muslim, I have friends that are Jewish and Judaism and Islam are very similar, man. We both are eat kosher. You can eat food like kosher food from um, that's prepared by Jewish people. It's one of the few religions where we can eat their food as well and not have any types of problems. The religions are very tightly tied. And it's sad that uh, we, we just can't see eye to eye on certain things and, you know, fighting over land, not being able to live together harmoniously. It's sad, man, and it's led to so much unnecessary bloodshed. He held a growing resentment towards the US and their part in the Palestinian conflict. All right, now we're starting to get into the dark side here, guys. By 1988, Bin Laden had split from Maktab al Kirmat, And whilst Azam continued to support the Afghan fighters, Bin Laden started growing his splinter Islamic faction. It is thought Al Qaeda was officially formed on August 11th, 1988. There's your birthday of Al Qaeda, one of the most notorious terrorist organizations known to humankind. August 11th, 1988, honor about. Although at this point, its name was not known in public, as its existence was still a closely guarded secret. A list of requirements for membership itemized the following. Listening ability, good manners, obedience, and making a pledge to follow one's superiors. In February 1989, the Soviet Union withdrew from Afghanistan, and Osama bin Laden returned to Saudi Arabia as a hero of jihad. A so obviously, guys, you can see here, this is, this is huge, you know. He was at the forefront of a resistance that sent back the Soviets, which the U.S. paid for, by the way. And he goes back to Saudi Arabia as a fucking rock star. But that's all about to start crashing down here very soon. His 50 minutes of fame are about to be up. With some of his new Al-Qaeda followers, it was believed he had brought down the mighty superpower of the Soviet Union. The same year, on the 24th of November, Abdullah Azam and two of his sons were driving to Friday prayers in the Sabah al Lili Mosque in Peshawar when an unknown assassin detonated a bomb as the vehicle approached, killing all three of them outright. After Azam's death, Osama bin Laden was the undisputed leader of the Arab fighters. So now his mentor is gone, out of the picture. So the Mujahideen and everything else pretty much died alongside him. So what's left? Just Al-Qaeda and bin Laden. Okay, guys, this is very important. This is where we get to the turning point in Bin Laden's relations with uh, Saudi Arabia, which then ends up souring his, his uh, situation with the United States even more so. From War Hero to what you're about to see here next. On August 12, 1990, Saddam Hussein invaded Kuwait, putting the Saudi government and the royal family at risk. Bin Laden offered the Saudi royal family as holy warriors to fight and defeat Saddam Hussein. So he, here's Osama, right? Just beat the Soviet Union in a war. He's got his Al Qaeda and the Mujah, the former Mujahideen guys. And he's like, yo, we just beat the Soviets. You know, 
obviously, I know it's a national security risk that Saddam Hussein and our, Iraq invaded Kuwait because Kuwait is very close to Saudi Arabia from a tactical situation. So I'm ready. Give me the give me the ball. We can go ahead and we can deal with these guys. And what ends up happening? You're going to see right here, guys, which ends up souring things forever. His offer was refused, and instead, the Saudi government accepts U.S. Secretary of Defense. So, oh shit, oh shit. Obviously, oh, y'all know that Bin Laden hates the United States because of their support of Israel. So, for his home country to accept aid from a foreign nation, not only a foreign nation, but a foreign nation of non-Muslims, he's looking at that like, what? you know, he looks at this as the, the ultimate betrayal. But of course, Saudi Arabia is being intelligent because it's like, bro, okay, we got some random freedom fighters that w beat the Soviets with U.S. aid. But, bro, why are we going to use y'all when the United States is offering to help us? And you guys are probably wondering, why is the United States um, protecting Saudi Arabia? Well, guys, because of the petrodollar. I mean, the United States uh, went into, had an agreement with the Saudis since the 70s, I think during the Nixon era, if I'm not mistaken, where they basically promised to protect the royal family in exchange that they do all their oil transactions in U.S. dollars. And that, my friends, is what has led and kept the United States at the top of the socioeconomic uh, list, okay, the, the, the totem pole, so to speak, or the food chain. Because when everyone has to do all their transactions in dollars to get oil, something as precious as oil, guess what? That instantly creates a high demand for dollars. And since there's a high demand in dollars and all the countries are doing transactions in dollars for a commodity that they need, like oil, that puts the U.S. in a very strong position. And they can only maintain that position by protecting Saudi Arabia. So for obvious reasons, when Iraq invaded Kuwait, they went to the United States for assistance versus Osama bin Laden. And he looked at this as a huge insult. Geopolitics is very important to know, guys. Dick Cheney's offer of American military assistance. Bin Laden was furious and started speaking out against the Saudi government, arguing that the Quran prohibited non-Muslims from setting foot in the Arabian Peninsula and that the two holiest shrines of Islam, Mecca and Medina, the cities in which the Prophet Muhammad received and recited Allah's message, should only be defended by Muslims. The and this is an example of his extremism. You know, he thinks, oh, they're infidels or they're kafir, as we would say in Arabic. They can't help, which, I mean, bro, that's that's not necessarily true. But this is his extremely strict interpretation of the Quran. And this is what extremists do. They take it to the next level. The Saudi government warned bin Laden about his criticism of the royal family, but he ignored their advice and continued with his rants. Bin Laden's refusal to comply meant that the royal family limited his freedom, ordering him to stay within the Saudi kingdom. So in response to this, what does he do? He moves to Sudan in the early 90s. In 1991, Bin Laden left Saudi Arabia after convincing one of the royals to approve a one-off trip to Pakistan to close down his business there. He promised to return, but instead moved first to Afghanistan before relocating to Sudan in 1992. He was accompanied to Sudan by a security detail whose weapon arsenal included SA-7s, Stinger missiles, AK-47s, RPGs, and PK machine guns. Whilst in Sudan, Bin Laden gains approval from the Sudanese government to set up many businesses, and he established a new base for his Al-Qaeda operations in Khartoum, and began moving more and more Afghan veterans from Pakistan, who he hired to work in his businesses as well as preparing them for future missions. And just so you guys know, Sudan, uh, that's where my family's from. It's an Arab-speaking country, a uh, Muslim Arab-speaking country in North Africa. Um, at the time, it was just Sudan. There was no such thing as a North and South Sudan. Obviously, nowadays, there's a North and South. But at the time, Sudan was the biggest country in Africa um, with a very strong Islamic base. It was pretty much the, the main uh, religion practice in the country. And uh, my parents are actually from Khartoum, which is the capital of Sudan. Yes. Other militant groups also began to congregate in Sudan to join bin Laden's al-Qaeda, including al-Jihadi and al-Ghamas, al-Islamiyah. All three militant groups came together for the purpose of restoring Islamic Jihad. Their goal was for the world to be ruled by Islam. Bin Laden was also being linked with Egyptian Islamic Jihad. Yeah. Now you guys can see where the extremism is starting to kick. So he gets ostracized by his own country. They pretty much, you know, tell him you're exiled and he says fuck it and he goes to sudan 
to conduct his operations. J, which later made up the core of Al-Qaeda. Bin Laden bought a large 22-bed house in al Mashtal Street in the affluent al Rihad quarter, as well as a retreat in Soba on the Blue Nile. He later moved all of his wives and children to the country. During his time in Sudan, Bin Laden heavily invested in infrastructure, agriculture, and other businesses. Many of his laborers were the same fighters who had been his comrades in the war against the Soviet Union. He was known to be generous to the poor and was popular with the Sudanese people. However, he continued to criticize King Fahad of Saudi Arabia, and in response, in 1994, Fahad stripped Bin Laden of his Saudi citizenship and persuaded... Oh, shit. Oh, shit! Oh, shit! Now, he went from, uh, and uh, guys, I want you to understand the gravity of this. So he's born to one of the richest families outside of royalty in Saudi Arabia. His father b builds a $5 billion, okay, at the time of his death, by the way, which in today's dollars is about $44 billion construction company in Saudi Arabia, where they pretty much do a whole bunch of construction on behalf of the royal family. They win most of the contracts. His father dies. He inherits $25 million. Um, he becomes more and more of a devout Muslim, starts to edge on the side of extremism, joins up with Azam, uh, becomes a freedom fighter, gives support, money, resources to freedom fighters that go to Afghanistan to fight off the Soviets in 1979. He ends up getting the Soviets to leave debt years later. He's looked at as a war hero. He is, um, you know, loved in his home country of Saudi Arabia. He's loved by Muslims all over the world because him and other freedom fighters have fought off the powerful Soviets with the U.S. dollar and U.S. Uh, help, by the way. So Saddam Hussein decides, let me go ahead and invade Kuwait. Instead of utilizing Osama bin Laden as his, his, you know, guerrilla army to fight off the Iraqis, the the print, the the Saudi royalty, intelligently so, by the way, uses the Americans to go ahead and fight them off. Osama looks at this as an ins a huge insult, so Osama starts to criticize the Saudi government. Well, anyone that knows anything about geopolitics knows that criticizing the Saudi government is probably not in your best interest. That's why that other Saudi Arabian uh, citizen, I forget his name, but he got killed in the Saudi Arabian um, the Saudi Arabian consulate in Turkey. I forget the guy's name. I can't remember. I'll, I'll Google it here in a second. But I watched the documentary on that, and I'm aware of that as well. But uh, the Saudi government does not do well with criticism so what do they do they say you know what we don't give a fuck about who your father is we don't care that he built up you know a large infrastructure of saudi arabia we're stripping you of your saudi arabian citizenship you're done and just so you guys know by the way and i know this because i have family that was born in saudi arabia etc it's extremely difficult to get saudi arabian citizenship keep in mind he is not technically his family isn't technically from saudi arabia they're yemenese guys so um he went from revered respected damn near folklore hero fighting off the soviets to now he's been stripped of his citizenship from his own home country and pretty much exiled and he's living in sudan so that show you guys that the, the rise to prominence and now what we're starting now is uh, what we're starting now is the descent let's keep going Hope you guys are enjoying the pod, man. This stuff is, a lot of people don't know this stuff about Bin Laden. I think it was very important for y'all to see who the man was before we get into, you know, uh, how the CIA was able to track him, et cetera, because this all led up to his radicalization, which obviously led to 9-11. He wasn't always a sick fuck, but he morphed into that, let the power get to his head. This family need to cut off his $7 million a year allowance. In response to this, the Sudanese government granted Bin Laden and his family Sudanese citizens. $7 million a year in the 90s. Let me see what that is today. Citizenship and passports. Bin Laden arranged. And that was former President Umar Bashir, by the way, back then. And that's what a Sudanese um, passport looks like. And I don't know this because I only know this because my parents. But uh, yeah. For the passports to be issued with fake names. Around this time, Osama's second wife, Khadija, asked for a divorce. Osama agreed and she left Sudan with the three children and moved back to Saudi. After the divorce, Osama married his fifth wife. However, the marriage was annulled shortly. Just so y'all know, uh, one, $7 million in 1990, roughly, was the equivalent of $15,896,373. So that means he was making damn near 1.15 divided by 12. He was making $1.8 million a month back in the fucking 90s, guys. Oh, shit! Oh, shit! That just oh, goes shit. to tell you how wealthy his family really was after for unknown reasons 
Okay. Now the attacks actually begin. On December 29th, 1992, there was a terrorist attack in Aden, Yemen, on a hotel that was used by American troops. On that day, however, there were no soldiers staying there, and two Austrian tourists were killed in the attack. Terrorism experts believe this was the first attack carried out by bin Laden and his Al-Qaeda organization, although it's never been proved. On the 26th of February 1993, the World Trade Center in New York was bombed. Six people are killed and over a thousand injured. Now, the World Trade Center bombing, guys, which we're going to link a little bit later. Now, just so y'all know, I went ahead and did a whole podcast on that because I knew we were going to cover 9-11 for you guys to actually understand uh, 9-11 100%. You should definitely watch this episode right here. Uh, This is the 1993 World Trade Center bombing, the foreshadow of 9-11. And this was basically uh, a terrorist attack that occurred in 93 at the bottom of the parking garage of the World Trade Center back in 93. And one of the, the, basically the mastermind behind it was the nephew of the mastermind of the 9-11 attacks, which I explained in the 9-11 episode right here, which we dropped last week. So watch, guys, so you could get a full understanding of 9-11, Bin Laden and Al-Qaeda and everything else like that. You're going to want to watch this. Uh, former Fed explains 9/11, and you're going to want to watch the 1993 World Trade Center bombing pod, and that's going to explain for you and bring everything to full circle about what happened um, surrounding 9/11 and all the events prior and after. It's believed the attack had links to Al Qaeda, ha- which it did. That was confirmed. The 93 World Trade Center bombing did have links to Al Qaeda because Ramzi Youssef, the orchestrator of that attack, was. Um, the uh, the the nephew of Khalid Sheikh, who was the mastermind of the nine eleven attacks, um, and those attacks were funded through Bin Laden, but uh, KSB was the actual mastermind that had the idea of flying planes into the towers. And just for you conspiracy theorists out there, because I know you guys are out there saying that's not true, I am definitely going to also do at the end of this series a breakdown of all the conspiracy theories. Um, on the 9-11 situation as well. You know, trying to be objective here with all the facts. Giving y'all everything and going to present it to you guys, then you guys can go ahead and make your decision after the fact. However, Bin Laden was never charged. In October 1993, the U.S. government humanitarian mission in Mogadishu, Somalia, was ambushed and 18 U.S. soldiers were killed. After the attack, Bin Laden admits that his fighters were involved. In 1995, the EIJ attempted to assassinate the Egyptian president, Hosni Mubarak. So now all these events are starting to get linked back to, to bin Laden, right? So you guys can see he's, he's, he's starting to actually take um, physical action on his beliefs now. The attempt failed and Sudan expelled the EIJ. In the wake of these attacks, the U.S. State Department accused Sudan of being a sponsor of international terrorism. And And that is why when I was an agent, guys, I almost never traveled to Sudan because Sudan was on the watch list uh, since they had um, shielded bin Laden uh, back in the early 90s. Because remember, guys, they had he was already on the U.S.'s radar at this point. And just so y'all know, Bill Clinton had an opportunity to kill him. And he admitted this during a board meeting in Australia once he had left the office uh, like a day or so before 9-11, ironically enough. And the reason why he didn't kill bin Laden when he had the chance was because the intelligence that they had, he was in a farm or like a village area where there was about three to 400 innocent people there. And they didn't, he, uh, Bill Clinton didn't want to hit them with a drone strike and kill a bunch of innocent people to get Bin Laden. So he let him, uh, he let him go. Um, which, you know, obviously, you know, that's why they call you commander in chief. And it's one of the most stressful jobs because you look at any president that takes office, you know, look at him four years after the fact or look at him eight years after the fact if he gets two terms and you'll see the age in, uh, in their face, man. It's really bad. I'll show you guys an example of this here in a second. Bin Laden. Of operating terror. Can you imagine making that decision, you know, kill a terrorist and kill innocent people in the process or you know, let them live and risk him potentially attacking your country. That's tough, man. I don't know if I'd be able to sleep with myself uh, with either decision. First training camps in the Sudanese desert. In 1995, Osama bin Laden wrote to King Fayyad of Saudi Arabia, calling for a campaign of insurgent attacks in the kingdom against the U.S. forces still stationed there. Shortly after, in Riyadh, Saudi Arabia, 
There is a truck bombing at a US-operated Saudi National Guard's training center. Five Americans and two Indians are killed. Bin Laden denies responsibility, but praises the attackers. By now, despite the Sudanese government being uncooperative, US intelligence started monitoring Bin Laden in Sudan. Bam, so they start uh, figuring out where, uh, what he's doing, what he's up to. Just to give you guys an example, look at this right here. Uh, Hold on. I don't know if y'all can see that. My bad, guys. Mm. God damn it. Sorry, guys. Bear with me here. I think I closed. Well, I didn't close it, but all right. There we go. So uh, let me stop screen. Share screen real quick. This is what George Bush looked like, guys, in 2000 versus 2008. Y'all can see the wear and tear on him, man. Let me see if I can enlarge this. Look at that, guys. That's what being president does to you, man. Holy, man. Oh, shit. Oh, Grant, shit. he had one of the most stressful presidencies of all time, you know, taking office and then pretty much getting hit with the worst terrorist attack of all time. But, you know, that's what being a president does to you. All right, let's get back to the, to the documentary here. Sorry about that little hiccup there, guys. We'll get back to the sauce. Sorry, guys, delay. All right, cool, we're back. Using operatives to run by daily and photograph activities at his compound. Okay, so now that we've pretty much went over his background, guys, we're going to go ahead and start getting into uh, him being on the CIA's radar and what led up to him being caught and captured. Okay, and this comes from uh, Manhunt, which is a documentary that tracked the, the movements and capture of bin Laden as told by CIA um, you know, employees that worked at the time. One of them is, is a CIA essentially operative right that's out here recruiting sources etc out there in the field and a couple of analysts and the woman that you guys are about to hear from right now her name sorry i wrote this down is um cindy storer uh, and she began tracking bin laden in 1995 guys so this is her analyzation of kind of the the hierarchy of the chart so during the Afghan-Soviet war, the camps were set up by bin Laden and others to train- Which we just discussed before. In uh, Afghans and people from, who came from all over the world to go and fight against the Soviets. Towards the end of the war, some of these camps got converted over into urban guerrilla warfare camps. And this was as what we now know was Al-Qaeda. We're taking over some of these camps and they were starting to train people to conduct urban guerrilla warfare in various countries like Egypt and Algeria. And I'm really glad they brought this woman because she's pretty much the subject matter expert when it comes to bin Laden. And you guys are gonna see here that she did quite a bit of work that the higher ups over at the CIA and the White House ignored. One of the prominent figures in the training camps in Afghanistan is a gentleman uh, who went by the war name of Abu Zubaydah. And for you guys that are wondering, we talked about Abu Zubaydah in uh, the other podcast where the FBI had done interviews with him and gotten information, were able to identify other key conspirators in the 9 11 uh, hijackings. He was definitely running parts of the camp's network. So now it's after the war, in the early 90s, we started to get all these reports about things blowing up all over the world. Which we just discussed earlier with, you know, uh, what happened in those foreign countries a, a minute ago, right? Where Bin Laden didn't necessarily take full credit of it, but he was sympathizing or had cryptic messages uh, when, when asked about it. So, you know, he even admitted that some of the people that were killed in Somalia were his freedom fighters, quote unquote. So now he's on the CIA's radar and this woman was involved in tracking him. Uh, and yeah, we'll see what she was able to work up. Who were from people who had fought in Afghanistan. 
So that's when we started to say to ourselves, what is going on here? You know, let's try to figure out, is there some kind of an organization? Is it a social movement? What is it? And we're starting to warn, look, this is going to be a problem. And we actually issued some of that warning before the first World Trade Center bombing. Bam. So again, he was on their radar in the early 90s. They were already giving warnings prior to 1993. And this individual right here to the left, guys, is Ramzi Youssef, the mastermind of the 1993 World Trade Center bombings. Again, for more information on this stuff, guys, so it makes more sense, go watch my World Trade Center, a 93 World Trade Center bombing video. This will put everything into perspective so you can see the full picture of 9-11. Ramsey Youssef, I'm sure everybody knows from the first World Trade Center attack. He is the cousin slash nephew of Khalid Sheikh Mohammed. And the attack was partly funded. Bam. And there's KSM right there. And this was the mastermind of the 9-11 attacks. Uh, and he was the one that came up with the idea of flying planes into the towers. By Khalid Sheikh Mohammed. The same year, there is the incident referred to as the Black Hawk Down incident. Osama pretty much indirectly took credit saying that some of his freedom fighters were involved in the death of those soldiers. We didn't learn until later the extent to which Al-Qaeda at least was involved. These plots are multiple nationalities. This is not your typical events, right? We can't pin this on any one terrorist group. What's going on here? Oh, I mean, it was bin Laden. There was no doubt that the common purpose had to be bin Laden. All of a sudden, it just hit me that this is a bureaucracy. So by 1998, we're able to say with confidence, this is a worldwide terrorist organization. Bin Laden is the head of this organization. Their goal is... Global jihad. So y'all heard this? 19, by 1998, they had already pretty much had this stuff all planned out, the CIA. Now let's see what happens next and what they did with this information. They want to create a global Islamic government. It's not just about Saudi Arabia. There was still some debate about what's called because some said it was called the Islamic Army. It was my analytical judgment that it was called Al Qaeda. So she writes the first warning to the president about Al-Qaeda. Let's look at the dates of when. And that's going to come up later. So now we're fast forwarding a little bit here, guys. Or rewinding in this case. And this is after Osama declares a formal war against the United States and the West for their occupancy and is, uh, of Palestine alongside Israel and the support of Israel. In their occupancy, I should say. Peter Bergen right here. Uh, famed journalist. Uh, in 97, he did Bin Laden's first Western interview, guys. At that time, in 97, Osama Bin Laden had declared war on the United States in an Arab-language newspaper, and no one paid any attention. You know, the case that I made to them... Well, as you know, if you're going to declare war on the United States, don't do it on the BBC, do it on a, an American network. Um, and, you know, CNN is seen all around the world. And this is, you know, and also we have a reputation for being, you know, fair. It was a lengthy process. They were very concerned. Are you agents of the CIA? Will you give Osama bin Laden a fair shake if we allow you to do this interview? Eventually, after a month or so, we got the sort of coded message that we're going to go and see bin Laden. They picked us up at dusk in a van, sort of like this, right? So, yeah, very similar to this, yeah. But in the evening, yeah. Yeah, in the yeah, evening, yeah. And then they gave us the sunglasses that had cardboard inside them. Right, a sort of crude blindfold. That's right. Did so, they, and they, did they put those on immediately on us? Or? Yep, they did. Yeah, yeah that's right. 
So that goes to show the paranoia that they were dealing with even back then. The interesting thing is that when you go to Kabul, you go through these tunnels. So right. the fact that we were blindfolded, you could hear, feel the change in air pressure and actually hear the difference in sound through yeah. the tunnel. It's amazing how much your uh, you know, senses heighten when your vision is obstructed or taken away from you. They can hear and feel everything when they're blindfolded. So you had a, something of a good idea of where we were heading. Yeah. yeah. And on the other side of this, this is where Al Qaeda had its chemical weapons, crude chemical weapons facility. That's right. Yeah. So we got to the sort of this plateau, right? I think it was about 6,000 feet up maybe or something like that. Something like that, yeah. And there was a small village, the type that would be used by shepherds to put their sheep in at night. Yeah. Peter Arnett was a correspondent. He was, we look almost human. He was at the time arguably the most famous journalist in the world. <laughs> they put the carpets down, so yeah. they made it respectable. And yeah. Then, yeah. And then we, as I recall, we waited for some period of time and had some sort of goat-like dinner. That's right, John. Well, like, you know, this is like the hostage video. <laughs> the hostage video. Do you recall when he came in? Yep. Hey, he shook your hand, right? Yep. yep. And do you remember what, what that felt like? Yeah, uh, it was um, sort of like a dead fish. It wasn't <laughs> a strong grass cold, a bit like Gulbuddin. I compare it sometimes to a, a bank manager's shake. You know? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Bin Laden. And another thing, too, I want to let y'all know, and this this is me speaking kind of from my experiences as a, growing up as a Muslim, like a lot of religious people, like guys that like are super, super devout, they don't really like shaking people's hands that aren't Muslim. So um, I'm not surprised that he kind of gave a, a feeble handshake because Guys like this don't respect Westerners in general. So, you know, he's probably doing this interview. You know, they do anything for the clout, as you would say. He was doing this for awareness so that America can know that he's waging a war, which back then, you know, ah, whatever, bro. You're just some fucking nigga in the caves. You don't give a shit. But um, we're gonna, you're going to show here in a second why Bin Laden was a threat and the U.S. government did not take him seriously back then. Is there anything you'd like to add? You could tell from his eyes and everything else like that and the awkward smile that he, he can't speak English. <laughs> Despite, you know, spending time in the UK and in, uh, in the United States. Mm -hmm. I think you just relax a minute, okay. I think. Fine. Just relax now. He's not used to this. <laughs> Yeah, he's used to doing interviews on Al Jazeera where he can speak in Arabic and not have to worry. So for him to sit there with British broadcasters that are, um, you know, infidels in his eyes, you can see the awkward tension in the air here. Well, the uh, Mr. Bin Laden's voice is in good condition. In good condition. It, it got better as you got out more into the subject as you talked about it. He goes, and uh, you know what, since we're listening to this on the audio version, let me re read what he's saying for y'all. Into the subject, as you talked about it. Because we got, we're up on Anchor, by the way, guys, anchor.fm slash Feta 1811. So for all my ninjas out there that like to listen to the podcast, I'll translate what he's saying. We believe that getting killed for the cause of Allah is a great honor wished for by our Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. As he once said, I swear to Allah, I wish to fight for God's cause and be killed. I'll fight and be killed. Hold on one second, my bad guys. 
I swear to Allah, I wish to fight for God's cause and be killed. I'll fight and be killed and fight again and be killed. Being killed for Allah's cause is a great honor. So as you guys can see, man, he's using this, uh, the Quran to kind of fit into what he thinks is right. You know, which is the textbook definition of an extremist, you know, waging war against innocent people that have nothing to do with the oppression that you and your people are facing is haram. Uh, quite frankly, guys, haram. like it, nowhere in the in the Quran does it say that killing innocent people is acceptable. You can't do it. You know, if you have an issue with the government, that's one thing, but you can't kill innocent people in pursuit of that political change. So this is where the extreme. Uh meets the rubber on the road and realizes that, yo, this this is not what you're supposed to do, my friend. Bestowed upon only the very best Muslims. We love this kind of death more than you love life. I did think that this was an amazing interview. And my Arabic is a little rusty, guys, but I can tell right away from the way he is speaking, he has that Saudi accent of Arabic. Yeah. He declared war in the United States for the first time to an English-speaking audience. <laughs> the hearts of Muslims are filled with hatred towards the United States of America. <laughs> and the American president. The president has a heart that won't listen to words. <laughs> which at this point, 97, Bill Clinton was in office. We asked him why. Because the American government is an unjust government. You know, he basically gave a laundry list of complaints about American foreign policy in the Muslim world. It has committed acts that are extremely unjust, hideous, and criminal. We asked him to clarify, did that mean a war against American soldiers or American civilians? They're not exonerated from responsibility because they elected their government. See, this is another example, guys, of him using his extremism to rationalize killing innocent people, you know? Because let's say even even if you do vote, did vote for these individuals that ended up committing these terrible acts, it's not like you signed off on them doing the terrible acts, if that makes sense. Like, let's be honest here. A lot of politicians, they promise one thing, they get in office and they do another. So, but what he's trying to do is he's trying to put the responsibility on the voters for the person that got in office that might do things that he doesn't necessarily like, which is ridiculous and ludicrous because it's not like the people are there sitting next to the president signing executive orders to invade Muslim countries, you know? So you can't hate the U.S. government and by extension kill innocent civilians and rationalize your cause under the guise of Islam and Jihad and a holy war and fighting for your lands. Like that's, you can't do that. But this is a textbook example of bin Laden misconstruing the teachings of the, of the Quran to fit his extremist ideology. You know, and I'm speaking about this, you know, and now I'm putting, you know, I'm speaking here from, uh, you know, a Muslim. Obviously, I'm not the most devout or the most religious, but I know the fundamental pillars, of course. And killing innocent people is definitely not one of them, regardless of who they elected into office or whatever. But again, this is what extremists do, guys. He sort of said American soldiers were the primary target. American civilians got in the way. That was their problem. We do not guarantee their safety. He said that, in his mind, the United States was as weak as the former Soviet Union. America boasted it was still powerful. Even after successive defeats from Vietnam to Beirut, from Aden to Somalia. And eventually, the United States, if it was subjected to enough violent pressure, would pull out of the Middle East and basically he would get his wish. Oh boy, was he wrong about that one? Holy. What are your future plans? And we're, when I do the next episode, guys, where I break down what they found in Bin Laden's home, you guys are going to see exactly what he thought was going to happen after the 9-11 attacks and how it actually backfired on him.
الاصحاب فهي مخططات كل مستقبليه ستراها ان شاء الله في الاعلام You'll see and hear about them in the media, God willing. Oh my God, this dude. Can we get a couple of still pictures now? Some photographs. And guys, when people say inshallah, that means God willing. The impact of the interview at the time was, I would say, pretty muted. You know, it didn't get a lot of play. And you guys can see, he's been lying, you know, um, slouches a lot but he's actually the tallest person in this photo you know you can see here that these guys are kind of propped up a little bit bin Laden is just sitting like right on his ass and he's still pretty much the same height as them he's six foot four but this was something you know that he kind of did during his, his interviews when he was sitting down because at the time which i thought was always kind of strange but you know he was a soft-spoken soft guy you know it's not like he was like a real killer, guys, you know, I'm sorry. Well, no, he was a killer, but I mean, as in like, he wasn't the one actually like on the front line shooting and killing people. He was a financier. He was there to support, etc. But as far as like him getting his actual hands dirty, uh, very rarely. Of course, he hadn't really done anything. Imagine if in 1937, the Japanese army had gone on NBC or RKO to say, hey, we are planning to attack the United States. You know, Pearl Harbor might have turned out differently. These guys repeatedly said publicly, we are planning to. That's a good point. I mean, if we, could you imagine if the Japanese run around? Yeah, we're going to we're going to attack y'all. You know, you think the U.S. would have been able to prevent Pearl Harbor. But, you know, fast forward decades later, you have this crazy guy in a cave saying that we're going to come and attack you. And, you know, the U.S. didn't take these threats seriously. Attack the United States. So no one paid any attention on This is, uh, you know, an Al Qaeda propaganda video. I want you guys to look at this and laugh at the crazy low quality and uh, production quality and com comic relief in this goddamn thing. Oh, no, no, this isn't the video. It's going to play in a little bit later, but that was an excerpt from one of their propaganda videos, which... Damn, these dudes need a fucking new editor. These Al Qaeda guys. <laughs> and that Kenya uh, embassy bombing was the first major attack that was linked to Bin Laden. The other ones were kind of like somewhat speculative. But this one was one of the main ones that linked them. And then the bombing of the USS Cole in the year 2000, which I have a little bit more info on that on our prior episode of 9-11, um, where Ali Sufan, the FBI agent from New York, was actually in Yemen at the time investigating that bombing and was able to find a high-level source that was able to pin him in the re direction of bin Laden. And I took, go into more detail on that in the last episode. Feel free to check that. Another propaganda video, which again, comedy guys, enjoy and get your popcorn ready. And here, the day when we destroyed the coal on the sea. So they're singing in Arabic about uh, destroying the USS coal, which killed a bunch of innocent Navy service members, which is despicable. But this is what they do to recruit um, new individuals that, for the cause. I always watched uh, their latest statements. <laughs> now y'all see what I'm talking about with these goddamn propaganda videos. <laughs> Their choices of what they're going to say are very important. Oh, yeah, they were cagey at first about claiming credit for anything. They didn't want to claim credit. Then later on, they become more willing to take credit, in fact, demanding credit for it. So they start to become more and more brazen. The jihad against America and fighting the Americans is at the core of our faith. This is Bin Laden speaking now. 
ومن صميم التوحيد. You know, it's all this stuff hitting you, all these horrible images hitting you. It's just this rapid fire, horribly evil. And you guys can see these propaganda videos are extremely violent. Evil music video slash horror film slash. Showing beheading, shootings, killing people. Al Qaeda is a global organization made up of people from over 60 countries who speak 60 different languages. So they really have to communicate in the clear through these statements. And they're also under a religious obligation to warn their enemy. So for all of those reasons, it made complete sense that they meant what they said. We know the Americans are listening to us here. We're launching a psychological war. <laughs> Could you imagine constantly letting your enemies know that you're going to attack them? Like, come on, man. <laughs> These guys, bro. But again, like, you know, um, Cindy was saying, they are obligated uh, through religion to notify. But could you imagine just like constantly being threatened by somebody? And I think the fact that they claim responsibility for so many attacks, the fact that they threaten the U.S. so often, it kind of made the U.S. say, dude, we're not scared of you, which, you know, that Huber started biting us ass, biting us in the ass a little bit, which you're going to see here in a second. But there were many times where the CIA warned uh, the Clinton and the Bush administration about bin Laden, especially the Clinton administration, because he was in office predominantly during this time. To shatter the enemy's prestige, don't worry about them listening. They're planning something, but where, when, what? Is it going to be an armed assault? Is it going to be a hijacking? Is it going to be an assassination, a bomb, uh, you know, is where there were no real answers? The CIA did very good warning in that period of time. There are dozens. All right, now we're going to go into when the CIA uh, warned other parties of the government about him. Well, they did fuck up with the FBI, though. They didn't tell them about two of the hijackers being in the United States because obviously the CIA always wants to classify everything, but we're gonna see some of the documents that were passed up the chain to the president that they ignored. Dozens and dozens of reports in which we express the view that bin Laden is intending to attack. April 20, 2001, bin Laden planning multiple operations. Attack the United States. We would have weekly or bi-weekly meetings sometimes on exactly. May 3rd, 2001, bin Laden public profile may presage uh, pres attack. Exactly what was going on. It's so frustrating when you can't figure out date and time. There's always a large band of uncertainty. Bin Laden Network's plan advancing. Uh, bin Laden Network's plans advancing. That's May 26, 2001. So a couple weeks after the last one I just read. And that's fertile ground. June 23rd, Bin Laden attacks may be imminent, 2001. For argument. June 30th, 2001, Bin Laden threats are real. And if you warn about every little thing, then you're crying wolf and nobody pays attention to you at all. Exactly. So you got bin Laden who they don't take him seriously because he sends too many warnings. Then you got the CIA writing constant reports. So the government's like, ah, yeah, whatever, bro. We're more concerned with some other stuff. Like, I don't think this dude in the cave is that important. Middle East. July 2nd, 2001. Planning for bin Laden attacks continues despite delays. South Asia, Europe, the United States, where? July 13, 2001, Bin Laden attacks delayed, but not abandoned. Guys, I mean, usually I make fun of the CIA, but bro, in this case, god damn. You, you, re they, you can't really blame them. They did their due diligence and notified, you know, the higher ups about these imminent attacks. You just don't know. We did not at this time and in this report have what I would call actionable intelligence. I want to know when, I want to know where, I want to know who. Oh, we could not. August 3rd, 2001, threat of impending Al-Qaeda attack to continue indefinitely. Determine time, target, and method. You know, I really wish I could tell you when and where, but it's not that easy with the clandestine organization. 
okay, well, if you just had more human assets, you did less analysis, then we would know all these things. Well, that isn't true. You can say we're pretty sure it's going to happen, but we can't make that decision to say you should do or not do. We can say that our bottom line is it looks pretty dangerous. Barbara sued wrote this memo to the president on August 6, 2001, and it titled, Bin Laden Determined to Strike U.S. Declassified and Approved for Release uh, April 10, 2004. Uh, I'll read a little bit of this for y'all. Clandestine foreign government and media reports indicate Bin Laden since 1997 is warned to conduct terrorist attacks in the U.S. Bin Laden's implied in U.S. television interviews in 97 and 98 that his followers would allow would follow the example of the World Trade Center bombing Ramzi Youssef and bring the fighting to America after U.S. missile strikes on his base in Afghanistan in 1998. Bin Laden told followers he wanted to retaliate in Washington according to a boom service. This is a source more likely here. An Egyptian Islamic Jihad operative told and boom service at the time that bin Laden was uh, planning to exploit the operative's access to us to mount a terrorist strike. And then this gets blanked out, but it goes here. Although bin Laden has not succeeded in attacks against the U.S. Embassy in Ken Kenya and Tanzania in 1998, demonstrate that he prepares operations years in advance and is not determined deterred by setbacks. Bin Laden associates uh, surveilled our embassies in Nairobi and Dar as Salam as early as uh, 1993, and some members of the Nairobi cell planning the bombings were arrested and deported in 1997. Al Qaeda members, including those who are U.S. citizens, have resided in or traveled to the U.S. for years, and the groups apparently maintain a uh, support structure that could aid attacks. Two Al Qaeda members found guilty in the conspiracy bomb embassies in East Africa we were U.S. citizens. So as you guys can see, this memo here is pretty damn detailed, man. And it came out uh, a little over a month prior to the 9-11 attacks. The headline says, Bin Laden determined to strike in U.S. There were just warning after warning after warning all spring. Well, you know, with the benefit of hindsight, we knew something huge was going to happen. And yeah, she's really emotional, guys. Earlier in the in the documentary, which I didn't show you guys, she was crying because um, the CIA got a lot of blame after this attack. And for her, she felt personally responsible, despite the fact that she generated so many intel products warning the government about bin Laden, because she was pretty much the main person targeting him since 1995. So obviously the chickens came to roost after 9-11, and she probably bared a brunt of that abuse that came her way, despite being fairly dil uh, diligent and, uh, how do I say this, proactive in her investigative efforts as an analyst. It would seem that this was a perfect warning in August of 2001 that the United States was about to be attacked. Everybody was completely tense. Why didn't we do something about this? The, the language being used by these guys was like, oh my God, what are they going to do? This propaganda video, literally, bro. <laughs> Get your popcorn ready. Y'all are about to see some poverty production here. They call this the Manhattan Raid. Look at this. The heroes of the raids. They call them the heroes of the raids received their intensive training and learn how to take over the navigation cap cabin to enable the pilots to fly the planes towards the targets. And ensure protection for them until the moment when the aircraft crashed into their targets. The brother pilots continued their preparation in complete calm deep inside America, disregarding the media's propaganda of America's all-powerful security and intelligence capabilities. Whose noise filled the world. 
<laughs> this is the cheesiest video ever. They're over here kicking each other and shit with masks on. Guys, if you're listening to this on, on Anchorman, and, and make sure you watch the YouTube video. This is too much comedy here. The heroes recorded their last wills and testaments in which they clarified their reasons and motivations behind their carrying out this blessed act. And, and I say to America, and this is one of the hijackers it looks like, if it wants its soldiers and people to be safe, then it must withdraw all its forces from the Muslim lands. And they're doing like a chant song. Now, this is, you know, something that kind of contradicts the conspiracy theory, which I'm going to break this down more. If it was an inside job, how would have they been able to coordinate with several other, you know, terrorists, essentially, and have them make videos, do all this overt stuff. Yo, uh, I attacked the United States and all this other stuff, knowing damn well that these guys hate America's guts. Like, why would they do anything in their power to help the United States if it was an inside job? So this is kind of, you know, where you can get that split in the road where like the, the conspiracy theorists might believe like it was an inside job for the government, but then the official story, uh, which we're describing here, kind of does make some sense because obviously these dudes had a deep hatred for the United, Sta United States. So it could go either way. You know, I'm being objective here, but I'm giving y'all another perspective and we will definitely break down the, um, sorry guys, I'm losing my train of thought here. I've been up all night having slept. I'll definitely be breaking down the conspiracy theory podcast as well from the new Pearl Harbor. Let's keep rolling. <laughs> course you can make the argument oh well they claim credit after you know it was, just, it was it was deemed it was an inside job there's a million conspiracies and you know rumors surrounding it but for all intents and purposes of this episode we're going you know to obviously document it from the government side then we'll go ahead and take the less official route with the conspiracy theory podcast on a later episode told y'all 9 11 was going to be a monster guys on the morning of 9 11 um I was sitting in my office. All right, so they're all about to reflect on what happened the day of 9-11. Office, I had a, uh, my office was here. The office of the group chief was right next to it. And I had my door open and I looked and there was an analyst running through the row between the cubicles. And um, it was one of the older analysts. And you don't see older analysts running. I was in, I was in Jordan. I was at the CIA. 9-11, I was in my office at NSA. I was at the executive office building for the White House. I was in the Pentagon uh, when it got hit. The first breaking news was coming in. And the interesting thing is anyone that's old enough to remember 9-11 will never forget where they were when they heard the news. You know, I know I won't. And, and I talked about where I was, what I was um, doing at the time of 9-11 back in 2001 when I was 11 years old on the other podcast. So if you guys want to know what your boy Myron Gaines back in the day was doing when these attacks were going down, go check out that pod. Somebody has it on real player on there. And just so y'all know that guy that they showed, he is a CIA operative that recruits sources in the Middle East, speaks Arabic fluently. They introduced him earlier in the pod, but that might be like, you know, the first time that you guys are actually seeing him here since we've been like kind of bouncing around the, the documentary to keep things nice and concise. At their desk. The report was saying there was a small aircraft that apparently had hit. Right then, second plane into the second tower. And I knew. There was no doubt in that office in that moment that this is what we were waiting for. This is it. That's the words that went through everybody's mind. This is it. This has been Laden. It's an attack. It's terrorism. And it's Al-Qaeda. I knew who they were. I knew what their intentions were. This is it. They pulled this thing off. We're going to battle stations. And we were all evacuated after that second plane went in because we thought the next one, that is the Shanksville plane, might be headed for us. It was complete chaos plane flew in under under my office. My my two assistants looked out the window and saw a 757 fly in under their feet. 
the order then went out for the building to be evacuated, except for the counterterrorism analysts. We, as you guys know, the FBI also vacated their building when this, these attacks went down as well. Essentially decamped from the high rises and moved on into the operations center. And I said, look, she says we can't go, but, um, you know, if you want to leave, I'll cover for you. And not one of those people left. Nineteen guys. Look at their faces. All right. Now we're going to fast forward to the dismantlement part. All right. So obviously we get attacked. They pretty much know it's been Laden. What are we going to do now? Is how alone the CIA felt in this period of time. Because obviously right after the 9-11 attacks, you know, everyone in the government is pointing fingers, not sharing information. The FBI is blaming the CIA. CIA is blaming the FBI. Uh, you know, everyone, you know, people are blaming INS and, the, you know, the State Department for issuing visas to these guys. You know, it was a whole big, you know, you did it, you did it, you did it. It's your fault. It's your fault. It's your fault, which, you know, led to the creation of the Department of Homeland Security. It led to more uh, comprehensive information sharing between agencies. It led to the FBI taking terrorism and making it the predominant investigative field, not the fucking mafia, because contrary to popular belief, you guys might not know this, but prior to 9-11, the FBI wasn't really going that hard on terrorism. They're more focused on, you know, organized crime, the mafia. They had a hard on for fucking guys like John Gotti versus, you know, terrorists. So this attack shifted the whole U.S. government to a whole other level. Luckily for the CIA, as you guys saw with those reports, they had been documenting and warning uh, the higher ups about bin Laden for a while. The issue, though, with the CIA, and I know this from working with them in the past, from my experience, is they don't share information with other agencies. It's all good and dandy that you guys are pressing information up your own you know, chain of command. But the reality is, if you're not sharing it with other agencies, especially agencies like the FBI, who are responsible for investigating these types of crimes, especially if they're domestic, because remember, guys, on the last pod, the CIA knew about two of the hijackers living in San Diego, yet they did not share that information with the FBI, which led to a real big battle. When you don't share information, this is what happens. So nowadays, the Joint Terrorism Task Force is much more inclusive. Agencies share a lot more information than they used to. Um, agencies were merged together like the INS service and um, customs to create a more robust and more, how do I say this, two, you know, two in one type deal agency, right, between customs and immigration officers being combined, you know, customs and uh, INS special agents being combined, et cetera. So the government did a whole restructure after this. And um, and now we're going to get into the dismantling part of Al-Qaeda after the attack. Just by virtue of the evolution of events and history, we ended up at this moment in time with kind of unique knowledge of this phenomenon, Al-Qaeda. I think the feeling all of us had was, this is on our shoulders to prevent this from ever happening again. The day of 9-11, the president pulled us together and said, I want to see a war plan here. Well, yeah, Bush wasn't fucking around, guys, after the 9-11 attacks. And actually, I want to show you guys a quick little video. And uh, some of you guys might be too young to remember this, but I think this is really important. Also, for my, you know, red pill guys out there, this right here, what I'm about to show y'all, is the definition, the pure definition of maintaining frame during a crisis. And I'm going to show you this interview while I play of uh, what Bush's response was at these attacks. That we'd been working on this for a long time. We were ready to go. All right, so check this, guys. Hmm. All right, hold on one second. So you just search here. Right, George Bush. 9-11, right? Good evening. 
Today, our fellow citizens, our way of life. I'll just play a clip of this, but as you guys can see, this was on September 11th itself, right after the attacks. Look at the frame control from George Bush. Our very freedom came under attack in a series of deliberate and deadly terrorist acts. The victims were in airplanes or in their offices, secretaries, businessmen and women, military and federal workers, moms and dads, friends and neighbors. Thousands of lives were suddenly ended by evil, despicable acts of terror. The pictures of airplanes flying into buildings, fires burning, huge, huge structures collapsing, have filled us with disbelief, terrible sadness, and a quiet, unyielding anger. These acts of mass murder were intended to frighten our nation into chaos and retreat, but they have failed. Our country is strong. A great people has been moved to defend a great nation. A W for W George W. Bush, my friends. W for GW. Terrorist attacks can shake the foundations of our biggest buildings, but they cannot touch the foundation of America. Bars. These acts shatter steel, but they cannot dent the steel of American resolve. Bars. America was targeted for attack because we're the brightest beacon for freedom and opportunity in the world. Facts. That's why they took down the Twin Towers. And this is specifically why KSM and Ramzi Youssef tried so hard to go after the WTC or the World Trade Center, because the, that symbolized American pow power, affluence and um, economic strength. So they went after something that symbolized that. And no one will keep that light from shining. Bam. Today, our nation saw evil, the very worst of human nature. And we responded with the best of America, with the daring of our rescue workers, with the caring of, for strangers and neighbors who came to give blood and help in any way they could. Immediately following the first attack, I implemented our government's emergency response plans. Which was a part of what you just heard telling the CIA we need a war plan. Our military is powerful and it's prepared. Our emergency teams are working in New York City and Washington, D.C. to help with local rescue efforts. Our first priority is to get help to those who have been injured and to take every precaution to protect our citizens at home and around the world from further attacks. I remember watching this speech as a kid, like not really knowing what's going on, but watching it back, you know, damn near two decades later, over two decades later, it, it's surreal, guys. And seeing how calm he is, how collected he is, uh, the unwavering intensity. I mean, this is probably one of the best speeches I've seen Bush ever deliver, let alone let a president deliver after such uh, a terrible act. You know, this is my friends, uh, textbook leadership 101. The functions of our government continue without interruption. Federal agencies in Washington, which had to be evacuated today, are reopening for essential personnel tonight and will be open for business tomorrow. Bars. Our financial institutions remain strong and the American economy will be open for business as well. The search- Letting the terrorists know that you can't stop us. Is underway for those who are behind these evil acts. I've directed the full resources of our intelligence and law enforcement communities to find those responsible and to bring them to justice. <coughs> Patriot Act. <coughs> oh, sorry. My, my, my. I forgot my mic was muted. We will make no distinction between the terrorists who committed these acts and those who harbor them. I appreciate so very much the members of Congress who have joined me in strongly condemning these attacks. And on behalf of the American people, I thank the many world leaders who have called to offer their condolences and assistance. America and our friends and allies Join with all those who want peace and security in the world. And we stand together to win the war against terrorism. Bars. You guys get the idea. But that right there, my friends, is textbook 101 frame control. Something that we can all learn from. The check to the documentary. Challenge when you look at Al Qaeda after 9 11 was to understand it well enough first to disrupt it and then dismantle it. 
we're not in the business of disruption alone because if you disrupt an organization, the adversary is so committed. I mean, they believe that what they do is inspired by a holy book, that they'll just go on and plot and another I gotta, attack. I got to show you guys one more clip. It's my bad. This is uh, too fucking lit right here. So this is George Bush um, visiting Ground Zero right after the attack. And check this out. Thank you all. Uh, I want you all to know, I can't go any louder. I want you all to know that America today, America today is on bended knee in prayer for the people whose lives were lost here, for the workers who work here. For the families who mourn. I think this was on September 12th or September 13th, like right after he did that address. But this is this is such an awesome clip, guys. This nation stands with the good people of New York City and New Jersey and Connecticut as we mourn the loss of thousands of our citizens. I can hear you. Hey. <laughs> So you guys can hear someone in the crowd kind of saying, we can't hear you, we can't hear you. And he responds, I can hear you, though. You know? I can hear you. The rest of the world hears you. And the people... And the people who knock these buildings down will hear all of us soon. That's what I'm fucking talking about. American flags in the fucking chat, man. Y'all know what time it is. I had to show you guys that clip, man. That right there, my friends, is textbook 101, frame control and taking a shitty situation, galvanizing your people and uniting them against a common front, man. So shout out to George W. Bush for staying steadfast in a crisis, man, where many other presidents would have cracked. And I don't think George Bush gets enough credit for uh, having, quite frankly, the hardest, hardest presidency that any other president has had to endure. So the business really became dismantlement. How do we destroy it? And that's a people business. How do you find the operators, financiers, trainers, etc.? And how can you know where they're gonna be tomorrow so you can pick them up? The explosion of intelligence at CIA after 911 is hard to imagine. You have a small group of people in Alex Station who are looking at the problem pre 911. So, Alex Station guys was the group of analysts that were responsible for looking at 911 and tracking Bin Laden way before. Obviously, it was only a team of like three to four girls, one like operative. So, obviously, they didn't prioritize it for, you know, serious, obvious reasons. But now, since they were able to identify Bin Laden as the main perpetrator, thanks to the FBI. Now the CIA is going, and well, they had already known this as well, but now at this point, they're allocating way more resources to that Alex section. They had limited resources. After 911, that small core group of people is dwarfed by the newcomers into the center post 911. So that lady that was crying is finally about to start to, is, is finally about to actually get some support now. It was a foundational change in the organization. Foundational charge for everyone in the government after. They needed managerial horsepower to support the increase in people and budget. I did not know enough about Al Qaeda. Just what little I had read in the press was not my specialty. But, you know, if you've had 25 years of experience, uh, you come uh, with a pretty good sense of what needs to be done, even if it's a new target for you. Pretty quickly. So they bring this guy in. You learn. With some hired muscle. You need to learn about that target. Jose Rodriguez ran the CIA's counterterrorism center. And he actually wrote a book as well, if I'm not mistaken, guys. I became the head of the Counter Center uh, just about the time when we were dealing with all these threats 
I mean, it was daily constant intelligence coming about a second wave of attacks. Uh, but I had a reputation for building strong teams. The phone rang, a senior came on the line, basically said, we need you to come back. You know the gravity of the situation. And here is right here, guys, Jose Rodriguez. You need to and let me pull him up real fast for y'all. Bear with me here, guys. Sorry. Director of National Clandestine Service. So this guy was like the, the top dude for all the international operations, you know, where they're waterboarding people and shit. This dude was the one overseeing it. Um, and he's an uh, American former intelligence officer who served as the director of National Clandestine Service, National Intel Central Intelligence Agency, which means basically all the, you know, dark side shit that we do. I'm the president of that. He was the CIA deputy director for operations before that position expanded to deputy NCS in November, uh, December 2004. Rodriguez was central figure in the 2005 CIA interrogation, videotapes destruction leading to the New York Times, uh, leading to the New York Times editorial board and Human Rights Watch to call for his prosecution. So, yeah, obviously, you know, this dude took the the, um, the Patriot Act to another level. We authorized a bunch of waterboarding, baby. This dude was, we, we might as well change his name to Waterboard Rodriguez. <laughs> <laughs> so, but hey, man, this was a different time. They were really trying to catch these guys. So they were like, we don't give a fuck. You know, this was a very volatile time for the U.S. Come back and do what you do. Marty Martin led the war uh, on Al Qaeda, the CIA's war. So this was the operative guys that was working, recruiting sources, etc., in the Middle East when this all went down. A part of Alex Station. Basically, came back to to be the senior manager uh, for the uh, worldwide effort against uh, Al Qaeda. I had a multi-dimensional responsibility. I had to protect my people. You know. We changed the rule book a bit. Uh, Patriot Act. We were empowered more. Uh, Patriot Act. We did things more aggressive. Uh, Patriot Act. <laughs> I love how he like is it doesn't want to refer to the Patriot Act and all of its like crazy expanded powers that allowed um, government officials like him. My job is to kill Al Qaeda. Either get shoulder to shoulder and get with us or get out of our way. So after 9-11, guys, these dudes pretty much got free reign to do whatever the fuck they wanted. I mean, hell, think about it. They were trying to prosecute Jose Rodriguez for some of the shit that he was doing. So that goes to show you guys the level of authority and latitude the Patriot Act gave to these individuals that years after the attacks, uh, they were like, hmm, maybe you guys have too much power. But once again, it illustrates how badly the United States wanted bin Laden and members of Al-Qaeda. We had been focusing on capturing Abu Zubaydah. We also spoke about him on the last episode with Ali Sufan interviewing him. Go check that pod for more info if you want. He knew who the leadership was. He knew their methods of attack, their targets. He was the highest level Al Qaeda terrorist that we had ever captured. So obviously a high value target. He got all kinds of waterboarding, guaranteed. <laughs> when we captured him in March, he was severely wounded. Yeah, I wonder how. <laughs> and we knew we had to get him out of Pakistan. And they in the fuck him up. The way the U.S. had dealt with issues like this was to transfer the terrorists to a friendly country for interrogation. But we needed to take responsibility for high-level terrorists ourselves. So we understood what we had to do. And we did it. Uh, waterboarding. <laughs> we took a lot of bad guys off the streets. To the black sites, guys. And they got put up in this now public knowledge and in nice little uh, 
uh, let's just say uh, uh, boutique uh, locations. Bro, <laughs> yo, there is nothing funnier than watching CIA employees talk about shit that used to be super classified that's declassified now and seeing them like not want to admit what the fuck was going on when clearly what it, it's declassified by now but that just goes to show like their fucking mindset of can't share information can't share information you know because i've worked with a couple spooks myself guys and they're super secretive for no fucking reason it could be stuff that's not even classified anymore you'll ask them for and they're like oh sorry what you need to know so you can see just from their mannerisms and how they're even talking about black sites or whatever that they just have a habit of not talking about certain things, even though it's fucking public information nowadays. But I uh, figured you guys would just pick up on that. It's kind of funny. Basically, you have two things you have to bring with you to an interrogation room, especially with individuals like Al-Qaeda. So this is Ali Sufan, guys. He's an FBI agent. And what you're about to see is the incredible difference between how CIA does things and how the FBI does things. And I think this is a perfect illustration of why they are so different agencies. Uh, you have to bring knowledge and you have to bring um, empathy. And uh, if you don't have those two, uh, I think most probably you're going to fail. And he gave us a couple of pieces of information during that early phase. Not to mention, guys, Ali Sufan interviewed this guy as well as the CIA did, both of them. Uh, but then he stopped talking. When he regained his strength, he stopped talking. And we became convinced that we had to come up with a new alternative to doing this because he was not working. The CIA received house approval for enhanced, uh, for enhanced interrogations. <laughs> oh, shit's about to get real. 12 techniques. Uh, and I'll outline them for you guys here in a second. The detainee may have a hood placed over his head. The use of 20-hour interrogations, removal of all comfort items, including religious items, switching the detainee from hot rations to MREs, removal of clothing, forced grooming, which obviously for, you know, these religious Muslims is torture. Using detainees' individuals' phobias, such as fear of dogs to induce stress. The use of scenarios to convince the detainee that death is imminent to his and or, fa to his, and or his family. Use of mild, non-injurious physical contact, such as grabbing. Exposure to cold weather or water. Use of a wet towel and dripping water to induce the misperception uh, of suffocation which is AKA waterboarding guys, the worst torture technique that the U.S. employs. Eight of the 12 techniques, in my humble opinion, were pretty wimpy stuff. <laughs> of course you would say that, Jose. Your name is Waterboard Rodriguez. You know, like slapping, give me a break. Okay, might be unpleasant to slap somebody, but it's not torture. Grabbing someone from the lapel, bring him in to you, may be unpleasant. And it's an attention grabber, but it's not torture. Now y'all see why they brought this guy in to oversee the clandestine <laughs> operations of the CIA. He was the head guy for all the waterboarding. <laughs> we didn't ask for this. We did not ask to get attacked. They did it. And so if we can't make them uncomfortable to save lives, this, we missed the boat here. I believe that the intention was, we can never allow this to happen. Let's do whatever needs to be done. They're straight up haters. There is no reasoning with them. Some individuals who were at the time in places to make decisions believe that the only reason you deal with these individuals is by techniques like this. If you deal with some of the hardcore our detainees, they might have become compliant and then maybe jovial and engaging. But if you ask him, what are you going to do if you ever get out? They will go, I'm going to come kill you, my friend. All the information. All right. So you guys are about to see the differences between the two agencies. And I love how they're doing this back and forth here. 
So you got Ali Sufan here, FBI agent. You got the other guy, CIA operative. Look at the vast difference in how they conduct their interviews and how they get information out of suspects and or detainees. That came from Abu Zubaydah. We got before waterboarding. Most of these things came from traditional interrogation techniques by showing people evidence, by putting detainees against each other, by pocket litter. So the traditional interrogation techniques. Pocket litter, guys, is also known as pocket trash, is when uh, whenever you're arrested, agents sometimes will, you know, take the things out of your contents out of your pocket, you know, search your car incident to arrest, etc. And what that does a lot of times is it gives you some pretty valuable information as to where the individual may have been, paper receipts, um, other evidence and or other things that may lead to a search warrant or develop the investigation more. So on one side, Ali's taking the more traditional FBI route for obvious reasons, because you can't be waterboarding, uh, you know, uh, detainees, because obviously you're not going to be able to um, get prosecution doing that shit. But the CIA, they don't give a fuck. They're just trying to get intel. They don't care about prosecution. So it's really interesting to see the, the uh, dichotomy between the two agencies and interrogation techniques. Work tremendously. We had the interrogators and we had the debriefers. Interrogators uh, would uh, work uh, with a detainee, and once they became compliant, uh, they would step back, and the debriefers, uh, the targeting analysts, the people who knew the most about the target, would step in and would begin to question them. Jennifer Matthews was there sitting in front of Abu Zubaydah, asking them questions. There is a big difference between being an expert behind- And so was this guy, Ali. Behind a desk and being a field expert. You can't argue with success. And the fact of the matter is that we were extremely successful. Once we started using the techniques on Abu Zubaydah, and once he became compliant, we started to collect incredible intelligence. Abu Zubaydah gave us the playbook of how to go after these individuals. So in short order, every chief of operations was either captured or killed. Ramsey bin Oshib, Nashiri, Hambali, KSM. Remember that guy? That was a nice one. KSM, uh, director of the 9-11 attacks. But they had him in an Arab uh, yuppie outfit. You know. <laughs> <laughs> oh, this guy, bro. <laughs> an Arab yuppie outfit. <laughs> Looking very prim and proper. Yeah, I'm like, forget this. I want every guy, bad guy downrange to know what their future is. This is this is their Mac Daddy. This is this is their chief gangster. Look at this. So obviously the CIA purposely put this shit out <laughs> as a deterrent for any other would-be terrorist. And it's actually kind of cool to get the first-hand operative saying, "Yo, this is the picture we put out for such and such." So now y'all know where this picture came from, man. Like the fucking video, because y'all ain't gonna get sauce like this anywhere else. This infamous photo. This is your future. Khalid Sheikh Mohammed was waterboarded 183 times. They tried to quantify the numbers. Holy! Oh shit! Oh shit! 183 oh, times of pourings of water, uh, and eventually the pourings of water in, used in waterboarding became times. So 183 total pourings of water on. Khalid Sheikh Mohammed became 183 times, which is crazy. Look, it's not FBI versus CIA. I know for a fact. Yeah, yeah, definitely is. <laughs> Y'all can see how they don't like each other. That everything that we've been told that resulted because of waterboarding, that's not true. Only three terrorists with American blood on their hands were ever waterboarded. In many cases, it was just a few days. In the case of Abu Zubair and Khalid Sheikh Mohammed, it was just a few weeks. This program evolved because, you know, some of the stuff that they tried to do was not working. And during the evolution process, 
I realized that we shouldn't be part of this and we should, I shouldn't be even a witness for this. And I reported it to our headquarters and headquarters pulled us out. And that's for obvious reasons, because I told you guys this before, the FBI operates in the dark, the CIA operates in the, in the, excuse me, the FBI operates in the light, the CIA operates in the dark. So for the FBI to be able to gather evidence for prosecution, they can't be aware and privy to certain things because honestly, let's say they did want to prosecute one of these guys and he was getting waterboarded. Well, guess what? Now your criminal case is out the window because you actually witnessed him getting waterboarded and that would significantly hurt his testimony. So goes to show. We all knew Americans would find out at some point about everything we were up to. There are no illusions. And so you have to try to provide a lens of history that doesn't exist yet. I understand people are uncomfortable with this, but the options we had were not very good. All right, so this is an address. I think this was somewhere around 2004, 2005. People of America, this talk is for you. About how to prevent another Manhattan. Before I begin, I say to you, that security is an indispensable pillar of human life. And that free men do not forfeit their security. I was on it. Uh, yeah, in late 2004, Bin Laden released his first video in three years. Because he went into hiding, guys, which we're going to talk about this more uh, on the capture of Bin Laden when the SEALs went to his compound. In the aftermath of 9-11, people expected and realized he would probably go to Tora Bora. What you did? After Tora Bora, he more likely than not went up to Konar and then somewhere. Well, it could have been in a, I always thought of him as running around in the, uh, maybe on the Afghan pack border, maybe even in Afghanistan. That's what my favorite would have been having him in Afghanistan because that was his spiritual home, so to speak, from the Afghan jihad. I was asked, where is Bin Laden all the time? That's got to be annoying. <laughs> when I went to testify to the Congress, the first thing they wanted to know is, where is Bin Laden? I went to the Oval Office a number of times. I was asked by the president, where is Bin Laden? Everybody would ask the same question. Where is Bin Laden? It was very frustrating. Could you imagine being the head of clandestine services where you're charged with not only finding, but also interrogating anybody associated to Bin Laden and finding out where he is and getting asked this every single fucking day from anyone that's higher up in the government with brass? talking to the president about this shit on damn near a weekly or monthly basis. Dude, an enormous amount of pressure on this guy. And you can see why he didn't give a fuck what his techniques were. He just wanted to get Bin Laden. Uh, to basically have to admit that he didn't know. One time, one of my colleagues came in to talk to me about where's Bin Laden. And I told him, look, you know, I am so tired of this, the next time that the next person asks me, where is Bin Laden? I'm going to say, you know what? Fuck you. <laughs> oh, shit. Oh, you. <laughs> I like that guy. And later man. that he goes, day, fucks. I went home. And the first thing my wife asked me when I get home is, where is Bin Laden? Why can't you find him? The toughest position to be in Al-Qaeda then was number three, number four. Because why? You had to communicate. You had to communicate to get attacks done. You had to communicate. And if you were doing that, we're on you. And that's why the CIA targeted, obviously, people that are close enough to Bin Laden to have info, but also far enough where they had to put themselves in a compromising position to get information to Bin Laden. And that was the trick that helped the CIA identify Bin Laden, as you guys are going to see here in a second, or identify where he was at. Frankly, even though in the back of our minds, we knew we had to get him someday, we were actually too busy going after those who were actually plotting against us. 
Congratulations, Abu Butthead. Uh, you're now number three in Al-Qaeda. <laughs> Bro, this guy. That's the good news. The bad news is you're now number three in Al-Qaeda. You better buckle your chin strap because your career path is probably going to be short-lived. There is an aspect. Shit's about to get real. Back to the intelligence business called targeting. I think this is a revolution for a couple of reasons. Just in the past 10 years, the agency has transitioned from strategic intelligence to tactical intelligence that helps you identify the movements and locations of one specific individual. I'm not just worried about what Al Qaeda looks like strategically. I want an analyst who's spending all their time looking at one target with one name and people whose whole goal in life is following one human being. Many of the Alex Station analysts took on new jobs. As you guys can see, now they're really buckling down. They became targeted as hunting Al-Qaeda leaders, not include, including bin Laden. And I'll tell you guys this from coming from the government. like For you to sit there and target only one person, that shows you the serious intent of the CIA to find these guys. They were willing to put everything else on the back burner. You know, fuck Russians that are spying or Chinese. Fuck all that. We're trying to find Bin Laden. You know, you a Russian spy? Good luck, bro. You, you know, good luck to you. You just basically came at the perfect time. We're hunting down these motherfuckers. We could care less about Sergey. We're more interested in fucking Muhammad. <laughs> I went to the other women who had become targeting officers when I moved over. Um, this lady was also critical in identifying uh, where Bin Laden was. Um, Jennifer Matthews and some of the other women who had already paved the way, just to ask them, how do I do this? I have to build this from the ground up, kind of like they did on the Bin Laden side. Um, you know, how do I do this? We still didn't have a great technical tool to do that. I built a spreadsheet. And when I reached out to, to Barbara and Gina and a few other women, they just said, that's how we do it. Go for it. That's exactly how you get it done. You're leaving a digital trail every day. So are terrorists. When that person travels, when that person gets on a phone, when we get information from a courier in Al-Qaeda about who he's touching and we bounce it against information we might have found out two years ago, they're looking at a human terrorist in the field and they might send a cable to a station that results in action against that target the next day. Somebody who wants in the fight. That's what a targeter is. You have to intimately know the target that you're going after, how you think that person is going to act, react, what they're going to do that day what their strategy is, who they're going to talk to, what are their priorities in life? Is it wife number one? Is it wife number two? Hope you guys are enjoying this breakdown, man. Like the goddamn video. This is some detailed stuff. And don't worry, guys, we're not going to go through the entire um, documentary. I'm just playing the most pertinent parts for y'all. Because on the next episode, I'm going to break down what they did after they found Bin Laden and what they found in his house after killing him. I was in Baghdad shortly after the war started. And... It was kind of like being in the Wild West. It was complete chaos. Bin Laden was initially excited about this. He was excited about Iraq. Um, this is something he couldn't, at the time, pull off. So he was happy to support the endeavor. <laughs>
he was such a brutal terrorist. I just felt like we owed it to the people of Iraq to remove him. Oh, so they go into how they were able to find and, and identify and kill this guy. So now we're going to get into the next part here. Getting into how they got actually ID'd Bin Laden. That Zarqawi was not being deferential. He was being insubordinate. So enter Hassan, Hassan Ghul. Ghul with her emissary from Al Qaeda. He was actually bringing over another letter from Al Qaeda Central to Zarqawi about how he should be conducting operations in Iraq. When we and the definition guys of emissary is a person sent on a special mission, usually as a diplomatic representative. So basically this guy had like courier type functions. We realized that Hassan Ghul would be traveling to Iraq. We decided this was an opportunity for us. So we actually planned an operation with, it was my team, with um, our base and the Kurdish government uh, to capture him. And we definitely, the Kurdish government kept him and we definitely gained a lot of information out of him, including Al Kuwaiti's name and the role that he played with bin Laden. Did that answer? <laughs> Do you know how this name, uh, Ahmed al Kuwaiti, came up? To this day, still classified. You know they waterboarded that boy. <laughs> <laughs> Within the, the course of a debriefing um, with the Kurdish government, Hassan Ghul gave up the name of al Kuwaiti, the courier. Ahmed from Kuwait? It was significant information. Even though we knew that the pseudonym al Kuwaiti was a throwaway, I mean, who, you know, it's like saying Jose the Puerto Rican, you know, could be anybody. The key is what he told us about Bin Laden, not using any other means of communicating. We asked. So this was his courier that was the only person that he pretty much had correspondence with. So this ghoul guy gives up El Kuwaiti, which is a critical moment. About the information of the courier. And he kind of just, he jumped back. His body language jumped back, he changed. And he said, no, no, no. Look, we all know even as little, little kids, if suddenly you react and go, no, 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 it probably means yes, yes, yes. He had not been truthful. So they know he, they're right over target. And KSM had purposely withheld this info. But later, and this is the benefits of having black sites, we intercepted a communication from him to some of the other detainees. Uh, he told his fellow detainees not to say a word about the courier, thereby telling us a lot about the courier. That he's of tremendous importance and that we were onto something. In late 2007, the um, Bin Laden cell came to me. Some of these people uh, have been doing this well before 9-11. I mean, they go all the way back to Alex Station. These people had spent their lives on this target. They said, we're going to try another approach. It's got to be the courier network. We've got some information on couriers. We're going to begin to build from that. The way it works is you know, information comes in, you, you catalog it, you organize it. You know, that little nugget there 
could sit fallow on your shelves for four or five years until something else comes in that's suddenly very illuminating about something that you may have had for a very long period of time. That actually happened in the work we did to hunt for Osama bin Laden by trying to track his courier. This is critical, guys. It took years for the agency to recruit the human source that eventually gave us the true name. That's why we're in the business of clandestine human intelligence. Uh, because you mean clandestine waterboarding? <laughs> because in many cases, all these fancy gadgets and everything else uh, won't give you the information that you really need. A true name. And we finally got his true name. Bam. Ibrahim Saeed. Which is whatever it is. <laughs> whatever. Arabic name, you know. But the true name, we were able to find out a lot about him. From then on, you know, the agency was able to do what he does so well. Track the guy. So just so you guys know, so you have a little bit of background here. At the time, Bin Laden wasn't hiding and he didn't use any other means of communication. He was living on a compound that basically had nothing attached to it. And his only way to communicate with anyone was one courier that came so that he can go ahead and pass messages back and forth to other members of Al-Qaeda since he was on a run. So for the CIA to find this was a huge break for them because you're not going to, rarely would you get an opportunity like this. And find him. He's not at all what you'd expect as a radical. He's a doctor, he's working at a refugee clinic. Turns out he had this very dangerous hobby on the side, which was writing this blog and getting himself in trouble. Over a period of months, he becomes one of the most visible writers on the internet. And the CIA and the Jordanian intelligence go all out to recruit Balawi to be a spy. Over several weeks, they convince him to go to work for them. <laughs> So he's saying they raided his house, interrogated him for hours, offered him millions of dollars. And they bought him a ticket and sent him to Waz uh, Waziristan on a mission. Obviously to meet other terrorists. Balawi finds his way into Pakistan and essentially disappears. Very likely somebody suspected him as being an informant and maybe cut his head off. Nobody hears anything from Balawi for three months. Suddenly, oh, he's back on the radar oh, screen again, and he's saying, "And for a source, that's terrible to see. You know, you're thinking your guy's dead or whatever, but luckily they hear from him." I've gotten inside. Balawi's a doctor. He's now beginning to treat the number two leader of Al Qaeda, Ayman Al Zawahiri. That's huge. <laughs> When Balawi sends this information to the CIA headquarters, the place goes crazy. Even the White House gets briefed. This young man, Balawi, is going to take us right to number two and maybe even to number one. Well, let's see what happens after this. The meeting has to take place in a place where the, the CIA can completely control the environment. And by default, this becomes the CIA basic coast. 
It falls to Jennifer Matthews to come up with a plan to get Bowie inside this Bay Set Coast without being detected. Well, the problem is that nobody in the CIA has ever met with Bowie. They make arrangements for him to come into the base without even being searched or checked because they're afraid that somebody might recognize him, his identity might be compromised. Oh man, looks like it might be a double cross. These are some of his videos, you know, released after the fact. People have been too quick to blame Jennifer. And, and that I reject totally because there were many people looking at this operation. Yeah, I mean, even the White House was excited. So, you know, how the hell do you think the main handler is going to feel? So, of course, she couldn't foresee what would happen. People wanted to believe that the source was good. God damn. There were also pressures coming from the White House and elsewhere saying, you know, pursue, pursue, pursue. We need to do this. I'm sure there were people, voices out there saying, uh, maybe not. Maybe we should slow down. That happens in many operations. This Seen that evil smirk right there? Sadistic. It happened in this one. So they set up a plan to get him through the checkpoints without being even looked at by the guards. He gets further into the base, goes to a second checkpoint, goes to a third checkpoint, and gets all the way into the innermost heart of the base, the inner sanctum. We'll get you, CIA team. Inshallah, we'll get you down. Their total of Inshallah means God willing. So look, he recorded a, a homemade video before he went in there. 14 CIA officers line up to meet him. Will this to, could come to you through unexpected way, inshallah. Baloui gets out of the car on the wrong side, and he's chanting the words in Arabic, God is great. Before anybody could stop Baloui, he fumbles for his detonator. Look, this is for you. It's not watch. It's detonator. To kill as much as I can, inshallah. You will be sent to the hell. Baloui hits a switch blows himself up, and there's a terrific explosion that kills almost everybody who's within direct uh, sight of a battle at the time of the explosion. Fucking terrible, man. Rest in peace to all those operatives, man, trying to keep the country safe. Um, and if you guys ever seen the movie Zero Dark Thirty, there's a scene where this actually was uh, replicated. So this is 100% a true story. It was based on a true event. We heard the explosion, but when we saw the smoke coming up from exactly where I knew Chapman was, that I knew the base had been hit. We knew that someone had gotten inside the base and we knew that it, it was the agency that had been hit uh, and we, we knew it was bad. By the time we got... So if you guys want, I'm gonna show you real quick the, um, the actual clip. And this is it right here. Camp Chapman attack, zero dark 30. I can't play it here because I know I'm going to get hit with a copyright. Uh, but if you guys want to, you know, check this out on your free time, it pretty much comes from the movie and it is damn near verbatim to the true tale of events. Oh, my bad. On the scene, um, it, was an, it was an ugly scene. Uh, there, were, there were parts everywhere. The conventional unit that was there landed uh, the helicopter right in the courtyard and evac as many of the wounded as possible. Um, you know, he said, Jen didn't make it. Uh, her logistics chief that we had worked with to close the base on a daily basis 
didn't make it, um, and some of his some of her case officers uh, never made it even back to the you know they died on the scene. When you do this and do this and do this, eventually. So a lot of people don't know this, but this was actually one of bin Laden's acts of terror. Um, the reason why it wasn't made public was because obviously it was very classified. So a lot of people don't know that bin Laden was actually responsible for this bombing as well. Another terrorist attack on uh, foreign soil. You lose one and we lost. And we lost really good people. When I heard that Jennifer was in coast, I was shocked that she was. She was like, the reason why I hit them all so hard, guys, is because she was like a kind of a senior person within that group, the Alex Station group. So obviously hit all of everyone that worked on the Bin Laden case for so long, really hard. Taken out by Bin Laden. I mean, that was just, it just seemed so surreal that that would happen to her. You know, after she spent so many years trying to prevent it. And yeah, and, and not only gotten killed by Bin Laden, but got killed by a source that you thought was trustworthy, but that confided more in Bin Laden. Essentially a double agent, guys. So one of the worst betrayals. Another tragedy by that the common American doesn't know. But y'all know now, thanks to Fed it. <laughs> Monk, Don't forget to like Monk, the goddamn video. I'll show you guys the quick situation here. Look, I've been working so goddamn long. The sun's actually out, guys. No cap in my raps. No one works harder than I do when it comes to this crap. So, guys, like the video, support the channel. Love y'all. Let's keep going. Him. No you know, sleep. In effect, had anything to do with her death. It's incredibly disheartening. There is some criticism of the agency. Frankly, I understand that. But you don't get a bada bod without coast. An agency that's not willing to take the risks that were evident at coast, which unfortunately ended tragically. That agency, if it's not willing to do that, is not an agency to do what it had to do to build that trail all the way to a bada bod. And a bada bod is where they eventually ended up finding bin Laden. Um, and yeah, guys, I mean, this is kind of the dark side of being a government employee and this type of work. Even when I was an agent, man, I knew every day that I might not come home. And, you know, I signed up for this, guys. You know, you, you take an oath to protect your country uh, through thick and thin, uh, you know, to the death almost. So she knew what she got into. Obviously, she died as a patriot. All those people died as patriots. Um, it's just that, you know, it's kind of a unwritten rule that death is an accepted outcome in this realm of. Uh, profession. And in fact, in fact, some of the human beings who built the trail to Abbottabad were actually killed at coast. This kind of Team America and the hunt for bin Laden and the fight against Al Qaeda. And there is powerful connective tissue between the two events. بالنسبة لي بلاد مثل هذه العملية الكبيرة الناجحة النوعية ومن بين هذه النسب هي عملية هبام لأن كانت استهدفت العسكريين وهي أهم في ألدة تنظيم القاعدة واستهدفت أي. Alright, so I'm fast forwarding a little bit. So now we're coming into how they found about about and where Bilal was actually living. لم يكن يسعى للموت في حقيقة الأمر. That's footage of him uh, watching TV. The hunt for the courier to Bin Laden makes complete sense to me. It was based. And then, bam! They tracked the courier to Abbottabad. Based on all of these years of experience working with a very tight knit group of people who really cared about this and supported each other. We invented the technique that works, 
And it's the technique that got Bin Laden in the end. I got a call from another former colleague. All right, so we'll end it there, guys. So that's pretty much how the CIA was able to build up their investigative efforts to identify Bin Laden and other members of Al-Qaeda. And the next episode that I do is going to illustrate what was done after they found the compound through that career and uh, what the Navy SEALs did, how they executed it, the entire game plan. So we're going to go into extreme detail with the raid, what was found in his house, and what we can interpret from what they found in his house, guys. So I hope you guys enjoyed that episode of Fed It, man. Uh, I'll catch you guys on the next one. I got to get some sleep. The sun's out. Love you guys. Peace. I was a special agent with Homeland Security Investigations, okay, guys? HSI. The cases that I did mostly were human smuggling and drug trafficking. No one else has these documents.